Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the UK Boarding School Eye Festival. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Wallace Wong, and I am the Registrar of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. I will also serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Now, today's agenda will include presentations from some of the best boys boarding schools in the UK. Each presentation will last approximately 30 minutes. During, at the end of each presentation, we will also include a Q&A session, which will last approximately 10 minutes. Now for this Q&A session, you're welcome to type in your questions in the Q&A text box. You can press the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, which will prompt up a box that will allow you to type your questions. I, the moderator, will then ask your questions aloud for our speakers to answer. We'll do our best to address all questions asked during today's Q&A for each presentation. At the end of each presentation, contact details of the presenting school or organization will be shown on your screen. We'll also follow up with a post-webinar survey to all of our viewers. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to the headmaster of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong, Mr. Howard Tuckett. Thank you, Howard. Everybody, thank you, Wallace. You can hear me all right? Yes. Good, okay, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, a very warm welcome to this third week of the Wickham Abbey Schools Hong Kong uh, UK Boarding Schools I Festival. Uh, this is the final webinar in our September series. Uh, in previous Saturdays, uh, we have welcomed on the Saturday, the 5th of September, uh, speakers from some of the finest co-educational boarding schools in the United Kingdom. Uh, we welcome speakers from Marlborough, from Seven Oaks School, from Rugby, and from Caterham School. Uh, last week on uh, Saturday the 12th, we welcomed speakers from girls' schools Down House, Wickham Abbey, Cheltenham Ladies' College, St Mary's Con, and Badminton. And today we welcome the boys' schools, and we have a whole afternoon of speakers from some of the top boys' boarding schools in the United Kingdom. We've also been very fortunate to be able to welcome independent speakers uh, throughout the three weeks of the festival. Emma van Bergen of BE Education, Jennifer Ma of Arch Education, and William Rees, who is an independent uh, specialist. We're very fortunate that today we will be hearing from two of these independent speakers, Jennifer Ma and William Rees. My sincere thanks to Ruth Benny and Top Schools in Hong Kong for hosting the entire three-week festival on their Zoom platform. Thank you, Ruth, and to your team for your support throughout the event. I'd like to introduce you to today's hosting team here at Wickham Abbey School in Hong Kong. Wallace Wong, our registrar, you have just heard from. We also welcome Donna Marie Mitchell, who is one of our year two teachers, and Helen Benalia Wood, who is one of our year one teachers. And you'll be hearing from the team through the afternoon as we thank and introduce our various speakers. I do hope you enjoy today's webinar, um, focusing on the boys' schools. And I would encourage you, as Wallace has described, to use the questioning function. We discovered over the weeks that actually um, the, the presentations, of course, are outstanding but so much uh, more focused discussion and much more focused information, specific information uh, comes to light from the questions that you raise. And do please use the chat box function to type your questions in. Um, without repeating everything Wallace has said, uh, where we can, we will type answers back to you from people who are on the team here today. Uh, alternatively, we will put the questions to the speakers after their various uh, presentations. I'm now going to switch over uh, to a message of welcome from Patrick Sherrington, who is the chair of the Wickham Abbey International. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Sherrington, and until March of this year, I was chairman of the Council of Wickham Abbey School in the UK. 
I was proud of my association with that school, which is a preeminent boarding school in Britain. And I'm proud of my continuing association with Wickham now as chair of Wickham Abbey International Limited, which is responsible for its international operations. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Wickham Abbey Festival of Boarding Schools, the first event of its kind. We're delighted that so many prestigious British boarding schools have been able to join us over three consecutive Saturdays for this event. Each of the presenters are key members of staff at their respective schools, and each speaker will be presenting on an important aspect of modern British education. This event is aimed at Hong Kong parents, and I know from having lived in Hong Kong myself for nearly 15 years, how important education is to Hong Kong parents. Everything you would see and hear is designed to inform you of the breadth and excellence of British boarding provision. And each speaker's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. And I would encourage you to ask as many questions as you like. Here in Hong Kong, Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong is a private British prep school. And as such, the headmaster, Howard Tuckett, and his team are experts at preparing young children for their secondary schools. So please feel free to contact Howard and the team at Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong for information about boarding schools in Britain at any time. And finally, may I thank again all of those schools for their participation in this event and all of you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Graham May of Abingdon School. Having read English at Oxford, Graham began his teaching career at Pocklington School and after short stints at Blundell's and Lord's Wandworth College, moved to St. Paul's School in London, where he was at various times head of drama, deputy head of English, and a teacher of Latin alongside his drama. Whilst he was at St. Paul's, he undertook a two-year exchange with Sydney Grammar School Australia. On return to London, Graham was quickly off to a head of English post at Cheltenham College, where he also started up curricular drama, was editor of a number of school publications and visiting tutor to a boarding house before moving on to Abingdon after five years. He inspects regularly for ISI and is a governor at two secondary schools. At Ad Abingdon, Graham has been deputy head academic since 2007. His core role is the strategic overview of the curriculum and of teaching and learning and the leadership of the heads of department. He is central to the recruitment of new teachers and prospective pupils and therefore heavily involved in advertising, marketing and interviewing. Though his main subject is English, he has also taught drama, ancient history, computing and PSHCE. He continues to direct drama productions when he can. Welcome, Graham. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that welcome. I do recognise most of that biography. Um, good uh, afternoon to you. Good morning uh, from the, the UK. Quite early morning here. Um, in what looks like being a, a, a nice late summer Saturday for us. I'm going to start by sharing my screen and hope this shows us the right thing um, because my main topic uh, that I'm going to talk about first of all and then move on to a little bit about Abingdon um, is on the curricular side to really talk about why a school like Abingdon um, has stuck with A-levels and why we think the A-level is, is really the gold standard. And that really means, therefore, talking a bit about comparisons between A-level um, and the IB as being the, the kind of most obvious alternative to A-levels. Um, there was, for a while, another alternative called Pre-U, run by Cambridge, but in fact, that's uh, they've now decided they're going to bring that to a close. So the main rival for, for A-level would, would remain IB. So I'm going to start off with some comparisons. 
let me start by saying um, I'm going to talk very much from Abingdon's point of view and why we have chosen um, to stick with A-levels. Uh, we did certainly think and we continue to think about the IB as an alternative and it is uh, a qualification for which I have a, a huge respect. I think there is an awful lot to like about the IB. It's just that we think there's more to like about the A-level system. So let's take a look at some things. You'll probably be aware of, of some very well-known IB providers in the UK. Um, there's just a few of them there. Some of them have already spoken at this event on, on uh, different Saturdays. Um, but what I think is really interesting to note is there's something around 2,600 independent schools in the UK. I wonder if you know how many of them are offering the IB diploma. Well, I looked it up and the answer is 73. So 73 independent schools in the UK offering the IB diploma. So it's not something, although it's been around for a very long time, it's not something which has really taken hold in the UK. It's, it's not pro proliferated, it's not something that everybody's looking at and thinking, well, that, that's the answer, that's got to be the way to do things. In fact, it's really not grown very much in the UK. Now, there can be all kinds of perspectives, and I'm certain somebody who was talking to you from uh, an IB school would absolutely tell you why, you know, that there are really good reasons why it hasn't taken hold, but the, the facts are the facts, it, it, it hasn't. Um, what is interesting, because if you go to any of the websites of those schools, you will find that the heads of those schools absolutely evangelizing for uh, for the IB. They will tell you things like, I've just taken these from their websites, uh, that make it sound as though IB is the only possible way and absolutely the answer to everything. It isn't a surprise. This, this is the kind of thing that, that heads do, of course. Um, and um, one of the reasons, possibly being a bit cynical, is it, it's a huge investment for a school to go into the IB. It's a huge money investment. Um, and of course, you know, a head has to argue very strongly for the benefits of what they've invested in. But I still ask that key question. If all that you're seeing on the screen there is true, particularly things like this one, which I'm going to come back to, uh, being told that the IB is every bit as specialist as the A-level programme, for example, that this is, IB is about being holistic and it's really the best preparation for university study. I stick with my question. If that's true, why has it not taken hold? Again, back to the numbers. So just to talk a little bit about the, the IB, again, I'm not speaking to somebody who teaches the IB. I've had a look at it and a, a pretty good look at it in, in my time and I'm, I'm not somebody who will never say never but just to remind people and maybe some people aren't, aren't completely aware of it this is how the IB works as you're seeing on the screen there that you you choose um, within these six groups so language usually your, your, your main language your native language um, of course being the IB they, they want you to acquire another language um, this is what some people might refer to as humanities, individual and societies. There's science down here, there's maths here, and then there's group six, which is the arts. And you can not do something from group six and you can choose another one uh, from, from these ones here. Usually you take three of those to, to the standard level, just to, just to kind of halfway through, and then you might take three or four of those through to, uh, th through to, the, to the higher level. Um, at the centre of it, they will always say, there are three other things that you need to be talking about. Uh, you'll be doing an extended essay of some kind. You do a, a, a module on theory of knowledge, how people acquire knowledge, and they think it's pretty important, as do we actually, that you are involved in your community and you're thinking about, 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 uh, about the service that you're giving. So it all sounds great, but it does come, as I put on the title here, it does come with certain strictures. It comes with, with some, some limitations to it because you'll push down particular routes. And you've got to like that. You've got to like that idea. So here are some of the, of the strictures as, as I see it. Uh, you've got to carry on doing your language. So if you're English, um, and English is your main language, it makes you carry on doing English all the way to, to, to age 18 and English literature. That might suit you. Of course it might suit you, but but not everybody. At a school like mine, um, English literature attracts uh, a good number, sort of 30 or so boys might do, might do English, uh, but a lot of them 
you know, they're happy you know, reading themselves, but they don't want to be studying English literature. They want to use their time for other things. Um, I think learning a foreign language is great, but it's not for everybody. And they don't necessarily want to do it in a, an academic environment. Um, you will have to do one science. That wouldn't necessarily have suited me at A-level. Um, you will have to carry on with maths. Again, I'm not sure that would have suited me. Um, According to the strictures, you can't be a triple scientist if you want. You can't be a triple linguist. I think there are possibly some routes around that if you do a very bespoke thing with IB, but it, it's certainly not straightforward or easy. Let's compare that, and I must here speak from, from a, an Abingdon point of view, compare that with how uh, A-level might work. So here are the A-level subjects uh, that Abingdon offers. So you can, you can see quite a list there. Um, and I suppose my key point here is our boys get a free choice. They get to choose within that group that you see there, the ones they want to do. We don't insist on any particular thing being done. We don't insist that everybody counts with us. Lots and lots of our boys do, probably about two thirds of them from GCSE, but we don't insist that they do that. We don't insist that they carry on with a language. And of course, within this, um, not for all subjects, but for a good number of subjects, you've got um, lots of opportunity to choose a particular syllabus. So we have different exam boards. Um, so you might be doing physics, you might be the head of physics, and you can choose, you can look at uh, OCR's physics specification, you can look at Edexcel's, you can look at AQA's, those are names of different exam boards, and you can choose the one that suits you. And they'll have slightly different content, they'll have slightly different ways in which they want the course to be organised, slightly different ways in which, in which they're going to assess things, and you can choose the route as a head of department uh, that suits you best and, and the people that you're teaching best. So just to give a, a few examples, uh, sorry, that's just gone back one to, to, to give a few examples of things which I'm not certain are possible in the IB at Abingdon, a boy can do that combination. But he can be in a tutor group in a boarding house next to a boy who's doing that combination and somebody who's doing that combination and somebody who's doing that combination and so on and so on and so on because you can choose which route works best for you according to what you are really interested in. And behind this are the principles which really I'm putting up on the screen, which is really, for me, the core of why we have stuck with, with A-level, because it's about freedom. It's about what you being able to choose where really you want to do a lot of study. At GCSE, at Abingdon, we do choose a lot of their subjects for them. So boys will do a core of uh, out of 10 GCSEs, they'll do a core usually of, of, of seven that we have chosen for them. By the time they're getting to A-level and they're thinking about university, they're thinking about wh what they might want to do there, um, we think it's the right thing to present them with more choice and allow them to begin to specialise. It's, it's, it's kind of like, like, like a triangle that it's work, you work with a, a broad base at the beginning and you narrow, narrow, narrow down to the things you're really interested in. And we certainly find that our students are very keen on the idea of being able to choose what they want to do and not be told what, they, what they're going to do by the time they're in sixth form. Um, we, you can have different points of view on this, but for me, I'm not terribly fussed about what boys are studying. It's the study, it's the, it's the desire to study, it's the motivation to study that is more important to me, that they want to study things. And time and time and time again, uh, it is shown to us that when boys, uh, students are studying what they want to study, that's when you get the real payback, what they're really inspired by. So, for example, even though we have all this choice, we do occasionally come across a boy and we get the sense that you know, perhaps his parents are choosing his A-levels or pushing him down a certain route. And we do a, a lot to try and stop that because, because more, much more often than not, it doesn't lead to a good place. If a boy's not doing something at A-level that he's really motivated by, it tends not to go very well. We fundamentally believe in that idea of, of choice and, and being able to drop things that you no longer enjoy, you just don't want to take on as, 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 a, as an academic thing, as I said. You know, our boys are very literate boys. They, 
not a huge number necessarily do English literature A level, but they do read. They're perfectly you know, able to do that and happy to do that, but they want to do it in their own way. So that principle of freedom for us is, is crucial. Again, I'm sure somebody from IB school will object to what I'm about to say, but this is my take on things. Um, first of all, I think it's pretty un incontrovertible that IB takes more time to do. It takes more curricular time to do. Um, it's simply in terms of the hours that they expect of you in the classroom, uh, it's, a, it's a bigger number. So here's my take on it. Who, you, you, you may like that. I think it's good. So the reasons that, I, that I've put up on the screen there. Uh, some people are, are afraid of, of what we call study periods. They think, well, if we give boys free time, well, what are they going to do with it? Um, boys at Abingdon use it to study. That may not be true of all schools. You, you, you may not feel that they have the maturity or, or the motivation to use their study periods. At Abingdon, for us, it's a really important thing because it's about moving towards university. So in the lower six, in year 12, they have a, they have a few, um, uh, they have, they have a, a, a few um, study periods and then usually by partway through the lower six and certainly by the upper six, they usually, they usually have a, a good number of them uh, for you know, maybe, maybe sort of eight or 10 across a, a cycle for us, which is a two week cycle when they can actually get on and do their own study. We think that's the right kind of preparation for them um, for what they're moving on to and pretty much all of our boys will move on to university. So my other question is always, it, it, do you have a problem occupying their time? Do you do not know what, what, what you do with, with that time if you were given it? I've got Abingdon's answer coming in a moment. Perhaps you really like the fact that the, the, the IB ethos, which is you know, very attractive in lots of ways, but it's, you know, it gives you something to hold on to. Uh, it, it gives you a structure. Uh, and perhaps you do just believe that you know, things should be a bit more controlled and, and perhaps a bit less in terms of student choice. That's not the way Abingdon goes, but, but that's our view. To give you a sense of the number of hours, and this is just taken from from the the the, the IB website, that's the kind of of, of, of sort of hours we're talking, um, which is I would say significantly less than you might expect at, at A level. So, on the depth versus breadth question, you saw one of those websites earlier on saying, "Well, there's just as much depth in in the IB." The received wisdom has always been, well, if you're going to do more subjects, which the IB makes you do, you're probably going to be doing them in less depth than you're doing uh, than you're doing A level. But some people would argue against it. You, you're going to get very different views. I'm, I'm giving you a view there. The University Admissions Officers Report was was kind of in 2017. Happy to to say what you said there, what, what you can see there. The IB good at encouraging a global outlook. But, but really there isn't much doubt. A-levels are the ones that give you the real in-depth expertise. So you know, listen to 10 people, get 10 different opinions, I'm sure. But I'm pretty convinced that, that A-level is, is, about, is about depth. So here's the big question for a school like Abingdon. OK, if you've gone with the depth, what about what perhaps the IB gives uh, students that, that a level aren't necessarily going to give them. Can you give them that depth, the rigor that comes with that, as well as that breadth of holistic education, as well as that global perspective? Um, and this is where I'm going to get you know, even more specific, really, about about Abingdon, uh, because yes is the answer. But I think you've got to have a really, really strong co-curricular program, a really strong ethos of exploration, a really strong ethos of development and being outward looking. So for a school like Abingdon, remember that's back to the A-level list and boys will be doing at the beginning of the, of, the, of the lower six, they'll be doing four of those. Very often that will reduce to three by the end of it. UK universities are still only looking for three rather than four A-levels. Um, so um, you know, our boys will tend to, by the upper six, focus in on those to make sure they maximise their grades on that. But we also expect um, or certainly encourage um, 
the EPQ. I'm going to talk a bit about that. That's the extended project qualification. Or if they're not going to take that on, which is a full qualification, uh, a good number of our boys also do our own internal summer project, as we call it. Um, and then what no boy at Abingdon can, can get out of, of being involved in the other half. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about those. So you remember the IB has its own extended project. Uh, and I think extended projects are, are fantastic. I, I, I usually supervise two or three of them myself to in the year they're brilliant things to supervise uh, for some key reasons um, for us essentially uh, the EPQ gets done from the spring of the lower six through to the autumn of the upper six and the brilliant thing about it is students get to choose whatever they want to talk about they set their own question under the guidance of of a supervisor like me often related to a level work but it can't overlap it can't just be doing more of the same uh, it's often related to things they're they're thinking about doing at university and it encourages genuine research skills so i don't teach them i don't teach the boys that i'm supervising in fact at abingdon we very deliberately assign uh, supervisors to boys um, in areas that the supervisor isn't an expert um, because if you are an expert in that area you're, you're tempted probably to become a teacher again and start teaching them actually my job is to organize the process make sure that their, their, their research base is sound um, to guide them along the way to be a kind of informed but not expert reader of what they write um, and and get them to think about the process because one of the key things for us is is this idea of accent the act uh, the accent on learning to learn um, because part of the self-assessment of that is um, is that you've got to be thinking all the time about the process you've gone through and and about 20 percent of the marks are allocated really to your reflection on what you've learned about learning during it for me and i've looked at the theory of knowledge element of ib for me that's really the best way to learn about learning is by doing things the theory of knowledge has got some wonderful concepts in it but i was i found it when i've looked at it it's rather separate you're kind of learning about learning without actually applying that in a direct way very often and i for me i think learning is about doing um, and I, I've, I've always found when I've looked at theory of knowledge um, unit, it just seems to me to be a bit divorced from actually applying it. Uh, other things about the, the EPQ, which I think are, are brilliant, um, is they have to do a presentation. So they're working on their presentation skills, their performance, their ability to talk to an audience and take questions on their feet. They don't know what the question is going to be. And they have to take questions on that. And they produce an essay or they can produce what's called an artifact. They can actually construct something. So a couple of years ago, we had a boy who, whose project was creating an app for, for, for an iPhone. Um, and and you had to have some writing back up for it, but the but the kind of product was 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 the app itself. So I would also say that learning to learn is a is a strong element of what you're doing in in A level as well. So very good preparation for A level, very very good preparation for boys, which is why we kind of time it as we do uh, for our students who are thinking about Oxbridge application. They usually have. Um, an EPQ under their belt um, and that is a brilliant thing to go to an Oxford um, uh, interview and be able to talk about because Oxford is always going to be looking at okay that's what you've done for A-level what else have you done what more have you done beyond your A-level course to show that you're really really interested in in your subject the EPQ is a great answer to that the other thing that's important, and when we talked about that idea of timing and maybe the IB takes up lots and lots of time, and uh, if you're doing A-level, perhaps you've got a bit less time than that in the classroom, what are you going to do with that time? Well, our answer is what we call the other half, and you've got to make time for that. Um, I am very used to interviewing, I've been interviewing boys from, from Hong Kong now for uh, sort of six or seven years, and it is very, very common for me to hear when I talk about motivation, why do you want to come to the UK? A, a, a very common strand is to hear uh, boys talking to me saying, in Hong Kong, pretty much every hour I've got is, is occupied with, with academic work. Uh, it breaks my heart when I, I see on somebody's profile that they say, well, I used to do piano, 
but I've not been able to do it recently because because there's just so much work I have to do and I come home from school and then I've got to go to this tutor or that tutor um, that is not Abingdon's philosophy we we don't think that you get the best academically out of boys by just shoving lots and lots and lots of work at them for us um, it's and these are just this is just a taste of a, a few pictures um, it's it's our extracurricular program and, and what and what that offers um, and for a school like Abingdon it's a huge huge number of activities and that's how we're occupying the boys time that IB perhaps might have them sat in a classroom for a bit longer. Um, this is from our, our website although actually I, I wrote it. Um, we do have this term uh, the other half um, we think it's unique to us, can't see any other school using it. And it really does encapsulate the philosophy uh, of Abingdon uh, that we say what you're doing in the classroom, that's half, that's half of you. There is a whole other half that we want to encourage, we want to prosper, we want to nurture. Um, and that's what's going on in the other half and on our pastoral side, that you've got to be developing everything else about you. Um, for Abingdon, we, I mean, we, we, we keep counting and recounting. It seems to go up every time we do it. We've, we've got something like over 150 different activities that a, that a boy might do. Um, it's pretty impossible, I would say, for a boy to come into school and, and do everything. One boy who was, who was head of school one year did tell me he reckoned he ticked everything off and done absolutely everything. He tried everything. Uh, I'm not quite sure that was feasible, but he, he reckoned he had. Um, so we're about choice. We're about and, and, and the key thing for us uh, there is that we don't insist on any particular thing. We don't say to a boy coming into year nine, for example, right, your sport is rugby. If you don't like rugby, that's fine. There are other things that you might do. Uh, not all 150 are available to every boy every second of the day. That would be impossible uh, for us to organise. So it's organised obviously by terms and a little bit by year groups, what's available. But there's no particular compulsion. The compulsion is that you must do something. So a boy can't come to Abingdon and say, I'm just going to work in the classroom. Uh, that's all I want to do. There's nothing else. And it's a key part of, of, of the interviews that I conduct. Um, so freedom of choice. And they'll work with a tutor. Um, who will help them try, try to balance those things, balancing not just the other half versus the academic and make sure that they're getting that balance right, but also within the other half. So a tutor might look at a boy who's very, very sporty, who just wants to do a main sport and then a couple of extra sports alongside in other slots, and will say, well, okay, but why don't you balance that a little bit with something a bit more cultural? Why don't you get involved in, in doing a magazine? Why don't you get involved in the debating society? How about you, know, you use your music? and be involved in one of the ensembles or orchestra and a tutor will try and help a boy keep that balance um, uh, of, of the other half. So as an example, um, this is just an example, uh, spring term is quite a good example of this of the middle term. In any week, Abingdon will be doing putting out the, this, this, kind of, the, this kind of roster. So huge number of hockey teams, football teams, but rowing will be there. Rugby will be carrying on in rugby sevens, cross country, fencing, badminton, squash, basketball. I don't think that's exhausting. If that's what's going on in a, in a week, you'll see those things particularly happening on Saturday. But in the same week, there'll be orchestra, there'll be all the, all the ensembles, there'll be other performances. And in the same week, there'll be people working on publications, there'll be debating, there'll be M MUN, Model United Nations, there'll be the chess club and so on and so on and so on and here's a key thing about it uh, coming at the bottom of the screen you can be one boy and you can be doing all three of those kind of categories it's not that at abingdon you're just sporty or you're just musical or all you do is the debating you can be all three of those things and our timetable is worked out so that you can participate in all three of those things you might have one that's more important to you you might be right up here in the in the first 11 for football uh, and not in the first orchestra but in the second orchestra um, and you might be go along to debating to offer points from the floor rather than being a main speaker that's that's fine that you've got one particular one that you want to emphasize but you're participating in a huge number of things that 
is what we think is important. That's what we think the IB would possibly constrict at a school like Abingdon, that freedom to do those other things. And my goodness, isn't the other half really important for the development of, um, of character, um, of teamwork, of those skills that we hear time and time again that employers are looking for in terms of ability to work with other people, solving problems, um, uh, resilience and perseverance. Yes, you can see those things on the academic side, but you see them in spade loads uh, when, you're, when you're looking at them uh, in, in a school's extracurricular. The last thing that I'll talk about then is, is this idea of global perspective. Um, just a couple of pictures to bring in there. Um, can you have global perspective in a school if you don't do IB? Well, yes, of course you can. Um, how do we do it at Abingdon? Uh, for us, it is immensely, immensely helped by the fact we, we, we're a boarding school um, and our day boys you know, absolutely embrace those borders that come into us, um, embrace their different cultures, that mix of cultures is fantastic. So you know, the whole school, for example, celebrates Chinese New Year. Um, and that is a huge input, but also the huge number of, of trips overseas that we have. You can see lots of sports trips going on, most recently going out to South Africa, things associated with particular activities. So um, you, I'm thinking of, of the music tour last year that went to Japan and, and indeed came to Hong Kong as well. Um, Subject-based ones, so, so uh, subject will often go out geography, for example, uh, going out to places like Iceland. I accompanied the physics trip. I'm, I, as you, as, if you heard my introduction, you, you know I'm no physicist, but I accompanied, because I was interested, the physics trip that went to CERN in Switzerland to look at things like the Large Hadron Collider last, last Christmas. That's a trip that goes every year, um, as well as ones that are just open to anybody, don't have to be doing a particular activity or subject to do it. For example, the annual skiing trip. So we we think that is is part of giving that global perspective and for us it comes again crucial idea it comes from experience it comes from really engaging and doing things not from just talking about doing it it comes from it comes from the experience of doing it so academically um unashamedly i'll, I'll put some results up there um for us uh, can you excel in, in A-level? Um, these results are pretty typical. We pu publish all our results going back years and years and years and years. You can see them for yourselves. I've, I've got links at the end. Um, so these are pretty typical. Um, for us, GCSEs are a real excellent point of, of kind of holding uh, students to account, a real moment of, of test for them at age of 16. Um, I've not, I've mostly focused on the idea of the, of the IB uh, diploma at, at sixth form level. The middle years program I know the IB offers, I don't see that its rigor is quite there in terms of what it's doing with 16 year olds, if I'm honest. I think GCSEs really do uh, place a lot of rigor and, and hold uh, students to account for, for their learning and give them a real test. Uh, A-levels, again, rigorous point of accountability, very well respected uh, by universities. Um, and just in terms of you know, does Abingdon produce the goods as well as doing all the other half and the, and the trips abroad, I, I hope those figures do speak for themselves in, in terms of what a school like Abingdon can, can produce uh, from its students. So three key things uh, just to finish off with, um, a school like Abingdon, very strong academics, the rigour of that GCSE and A-level, the depth that comes from doing A-level subjects, holistic education, Key for us is that other half, the co-curricular provision, pastoral support, very much a philosophy of doing, not just talking about doing, but actually actively doing things. Um, and then that strong worldview that comes from that fantastic blend we have of boarding and, and day pupils, and what I've referred to there as the, the expedition philosophy, the, the idea of getting out and actually going out into the world and doing things. So I'm gonna see what questions have come my way. Um, that's just a, an aerial shot of Abingdon School, and I will just leave it on for anybody who wants to note anything down. Some of those key areas that I've talked about there, I mean, if you just go to our website, uh, abingdon.org.uk, obviously you can go anywhere, but, but uh, you know, other half is there, academic performance, and then from the admissions department, you know, two key things. So I think that's, I think uh, I'll be told if I've got run over time horribly, Wallace, but I think I'm pretty much on time uh, for, for, to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Graham. That was great. Uh, yes, yeah, so let's begin the Q&A session. We do have time for a few questions, so uh, I'll begin right away. So the first question we have is, um, first of all, thank you for the uh, presentation and the 
and all the insights on the differences between A levels and IB. Now, uh, are you concerned about the grade inflation in A levels in recent years? And has that changed the dynamics of university entrance? Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> this year aside, which is a very unusual year because we were all doing center assess grades, um, I don't think the grade inflation has been extreme. Actually, I think they've, they've tried to keep a, a good control over things. But of course, what they did not all that long ago was, was bring in the A star. Um, so you know, that was a way really of distinguishing at that, at that very, very top level. Um, and I suspect partly in reaction to people's fears about, about grade inflation. Uh, you, we, we could spend a long time talking about grade inflation. One, one of the things I think schools are all, always, it's kind of being beaten with a stick. We're all supposed to be improving. We're all supposed to be getting better in what we're doing. So you ought to see that in the results. If you didn't see an improvement in results, people will be saying to us, well, what are you doing to improve? But when you do improve, people then say, oh, that's only grade inflation. So you end up between a rock and a hard place in terms of, you know, if you're trying to improve and get results better, but then people are saying, well, they're only getting better because they're giving the grades more easily. It doesn't seem very fair to me. Uh, it feels to me, in terms of teaching A-level, it's, it's, it's a good, strong standard. But there, the A-star is there for you know, some distinction, and some universities are definitely using it, Cambridge in particular, I would say. Uh, sure, uh, of course. Thank you, Graham. Um, and just furthermore into uh, your presentation, now a uh, few of our attendees are asking if my child is coming from an IB school uh, and they're trying to apply to IB, is that a difficult uh, transition or journey? And just in general for uh, those who are interested in boarding schools but are coming from an IB school. Coming from doing probably the middle years program, you mean? Correct. Yes. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, no. No. I mean, they. They. We need to know that that a certain level of content has been covered. You know, there's there's an expectation. GCSEs lead very neatly on to A levels, and we partly choose our GCSEs matching against the likelihood of, of, of our students going on to, to A level. Um, so that's, but you know, when I talked about choice of, of syllabus, that's partly sometimes why we do it, sometimes why we've chosen the, the international GCSE over the homegrown one, because about how its preparation is. So we would need to, you know, they, they would sit the same tests, we, we set a paper in each of the subjects that they might do, as well as some, some general like my verbal reasoning and, 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 and an English essay if their native language isn't English um, to, to test and then we do an interview. So it very much depends on, on sort of case by case. It, it might be awkward if they want to do physics A level and they haven't covered an awful lot of what would be in an IGC, IGCC specification. It's not necessarily the end of the, end of the line because work can be done over the summer in between, uh, but you know, we, we would have to have a close look at it. Sure, uh, thank you. And uh, I, I believe we may have time for about one more question, so I'll, I'll make this one a little bit uh, uh, longer. Now, um, we do okay. have a few attendees asking, um, how does the application process typically look for someone that's applying from Hong Kong? And let's say they're interested in applying uh, this year, how would that process look? Um, and then furthermore, on top of that question is, um, we do see the standard years of entry uh, on the website, but do you also take students uh, that are older or uh, in other years? Um, okay, well, standard years of entry, so year nine, year 10, and year 12, mm -hmm. boys can't, can't come into year 11, you can't come in halfway through um, at the GCSE course. Um, and at year seven and eight, um, we don't board at year seven and eight. So if it's, if it's a boarding place, we don't begin until until year nine. So, and, and also, no, you wouldn't take someone into year 13 halfway through an A-level course. So that, that's why. Broadly, although there's a lot more information and, and you can see the, the links there on, on, the, on, on the slide I've left up. Um, broadly, um, people come to us often using an agent uh, in, in, in Hong Kong. I'm, I'm not going to name any particular ones. You know, you know who they are. Um, but yeah, they'll use, often use an agent, but sometimes people will just contact us directly. Um, and depending on the sequence of things, sometimes, you know, usually, of course, we'd be over there in Hong Kong at the moment, we might do some interviews beforehand, and then boys would come on to do our exams. Uh, sometimes they, they do our exams first, and then, and then we do an interview with them. Uh, 
depends on what level, but if, if below A level, they'll do an exam in English, um, looking at comprehension and at composition, so English writing, they'll do an exam in maths, they'll do, they'll do a reasoning a, a exam and they'll do a grammar test usually. Um, and then for most boys, not all, for most boys that would lead on to an interview, uh, quite often with me, no, though not, not always, I mean quite frankly there, there are so many applicants I don't think I can do them all myself usually, but, but, but I, I do a lot of them. At A level as, as described we, we, we give them a paper in what subjects they want to do in the English essay and the grammar and the verbal reasoning and the interview as well. Um, we very much invite people to come across to the UK if they're able to, uh, but we're also very happy uh, with kind of approved centres with, with sending papers across. So you know, some of our agencies will do that for us, uh, the British Commission will do that for us, so we, we, you know, we, we're happy with certain places that we will send the exams across. Does that give a broad enough view without too much detail? There's a lot more detail on our website. Uh, sure, no, that does. Um, and just, uh, yes, no, that's great. And just more specifically, <laughs> uh, for those that are uh, wanting to apply from Hong Kong this year, um, how does for that next year. Yes, for next year. Should they start now if they're looking Absolutely. for a 2021 entry? Yeah, so I mean 2021 for us, I, I have to say, is uh, pretty much already full. Not totally, sixth form we'd be interested in. Third year, year nine entry 2021, um, probably for Abingdon, uh, the bad news is you, you, the, the best you can hope for at the moment is a waiting list place. Year 10 possibly, but more likely a uh, waiting list. But we do take boys from the waiting list during the year. It, it does happen. It's not that you know, people sit on the waiting list and, and then there's never any change. Really, uh, for Abingdon, um, it's, it's moved into a game where you need to be thinking two years ahead. Um, so you know, for, it's, it's 2022, certainly for year nine and year 10, that, that people should be thinking about Abingdon. Um, but six forms you know, often a little bit different. But but even then, we'd encourage people to be to be looking uh, a bit ahead. But I'm 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 conscious that the sixth form, um, it, it tends to be people aren't certain about that until just before, and and we have a few more places there. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Graham. Okay. And before I let you go, um, I believe that's all the time we have for today. Uh, do you have any last words for our guests? No, thank you. I, I'm so sorry that that we can't we can't be with you in in Hong Kong. We we Jane and I, Jane, my colleague, who I, I know is is watching what's going on at the moment. We come across to Hong Kong every, every year and and just love our time there um, and you know, interviewing people, learning a bit more about. I think it's so important uh, that we. I mean, you know, some people say, you know, when all this is over, is anybody going to fly anywhere anymore? We think it's really important that we come, that we're not just sat in England and, you know, and, and saying, well, come to us, but we don't know anything about you. Uh, I'm so sorry I can't be there. That's my message. I really enjoy my time in Hong Kong, uh, learning more about it, trying to visit a different place every time that I go. I haven't yet been allowed by, by the head of the Director of Missions to go to Ocean Park, but that is my, my big aim uh, when, I, when I'm allowed back into Hong Kong. Uh, so uh, that's it. It. I, I, I'd much rather be doing this in person than, than over Zoom, but, but you know, this, this is where we're in at the moment. So thank you very much, uh, Wallace, and, and thank you um, uh, for, to, to Wickham for hosting. Well, thank you so much, Graham, for your very insightful and detailed presentation and for the questions which you've just answered. Thanks very much. Our next speaker will be Dr. Nick Black from Dulwich College. Dr. Nick Black is a Director of Admissions at Dulwich College, having formerly been Head of the Middle School, years 9 to 11, and Head of History. His British Naval staff in the First World War was awarded the Anderson Medal in 2010. Nick co-edited Dulwich 400 in 2019, described by one correspondent as a rare example of wit in scholarship. Welcome, Dr. Nick Black. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to share my screen. Good morning. So, uh, yeah, I, so I teach at Dulwich College um, and you can see an aerial shot of the college uh, in this picture. Um, it's got about 70 acres of grounds, um, uh, which might surprise people given it's in London. And uh, it's, it's about 12 minutes on the train from London, Victoria, 
uh, so easy access to um, airports and uh, central London for, for all people. It's a boys' school. Um, we are predominantly a day school, um, but we have about 150 boarders. Um, and pastorally, uh, we are a form based school, which means the sort of day to day experience of boarders is that they are members of forms, uh, which obviously means that they mix uh, every day, um, not just through lessons, but in their pastoral time with, with the day boys, who obviously are uh, a cross section of the population of London. The campus itself uh, is, is, is extensive. We've been on this site, um, this particular one for 150 years, in Dulwich itself for 400 years. Um, and at the center of it are the, these historic uh, listed buildings, um, which is uh, where the things like the Great Hall, the library uh, and classrooms are. And next door to it is a newly built um, science uh, building with an auditorium, uh, 20 laboratories and our IT rooms. I've been asked to talk about two things. Um, one is a teaching resilience and the other is a little bit about thinking, you know, the, th the questions I guess you should ask about university and life after school. Um, and, I, and the first thing is, is teaching resilience. Uh, the picture is, is of a, a, a man who was a boy at Dulwich College, as you can see in the 1880s, you may have heard of him, Ernest Shackleton, he was a, he was a polar explorer. And I guess the thing about resilience is things don't always go right, you know, and I think it's quite hard sometimes to, how do you teach that? How do you teach being able to think about and cope with having to change your mind, having to adapt, having to often be quite spontaneous in terms of the plans that you think you have and the way that you need to respond above all to kind of failure. Um, the picture here shows Shackleton's boat being crushed in the ice at the South Pole during the First World War. His scheme went wrong, you know, and how do you then adapt that and then bring all of his um, fellow uh, explorers on this on this particular expedition home um, and escape across the ice, across the South Atlantic? Extraordinary journey. And I guess it's that sense of being adaptable to your circumstances, which is something which schools uh, really want you as, as pupils to try and learn and think about as you go through the school. Um, his lifeboat is, is at the centre of, of our science block. You can see it there uh, on the ground floor. Uh, the waves around it from the South Atlantic apparently as high as the building itself. And, uh, and therefore I've got this kind of thought at the bottom, which is this sense of both the safety belt, you know, schools want to have layers of support in place um, for all of those questions which arise, which are complicated, which cause doubt. You know, what am I supposed to do? How do I respond to this? But also, I think, as we all do in, in our own lives, we often basically learn from things that go wrong. Um, I sometimes as a teacher, you sometimes worry about these people with charmed lives where nothing ever goes wrong and just wonder to what extent they do maybe develop layers of empathy if, if they haven't experienced um, what most of us do when, when things go awry somewhat. And I think there's a balance there between having, as it were, the support, but also having the, the sense in which you can, you can fail. You know, things can go wrong. And how do you respond to that? How do you adapt to that? And I think there are various things that as schools we try and do to inculcate, I guess, some of those skills into the pupils during their time with us. So, um, and there's a picture of Shackleton he, in that same boat. Um, he went 800 miles across the South Atlantic and then had to go across, walk across South Georgia as well to get help. Uh, extraordinary story. Um, but everyone survived, and I guess that's, that's the message really. Um, clearly, working with your teachers is, is a central thing. Um, and having that sense of responding to assessment. I think it's all very well for teachers to, to mark work, but it's, it's that dialogue that you have with them and talk about them and have that openness to rethinking things. Um, you know, when I do uh, interviews for university candidates, uh, one of the things that seems to me is that sense of a, if I was a university teacher, you know, late Friday afternoon on a kind of February, in a February, 
you know, does my heart sink hearing those footsteps coming up the stairs? Or am I excited by it? And it's, it's that sense of which, you know, you can adapt to, well, have you thought about this? Um, well, what about this evidence? Does that change what you're thinking about? And I think that ability to interact and talk to teachers, I think is an essential thing in developing that ability to respond and, and to rethink, recalibrate your own ideas. And it's not just about A-levels and public exams. I think there is a real sense in which you perhaps can put yourselves in places which are less structured and formed, and therefore where there is more space for you to develop your own ideas, to bounce them off teachers and other people's work. Um, and, and, and at Dulwich, there are a number of these kind of forums by which you can do that. So for boys in the upper school, which are the two years of A-level, um, there are essays that they're expected to do over the summer holidays, competitions that the that, that boys enter. Um, one of the boys I talked to last term entered the Velocop History Prize in Cambridge, which actually won um, with, a, with an essay on witchcraft in Scotland in the early 17th century. Um, interesting kind of social topic. Um, and we also teach a course is called A-Level Plus, which is an ability sometimes filling in the gaps between A-levels. You know, in some ways, subjects haven't changed hugely, um, you might say for 100 years or more. Uh, and how do you, if you know, want to go and read law or you think that's something you know, you're interested in in a later career? Um, we don't do law as an A-level, um, yet you could do a course which might, you know, drawing on your experience, maybe as a historian or doing English or something like that, that, that begins to think about the nature of law and the subjects, you know, the questions that might arise from it. Or there's another one on engineering, there's another one on cities and the imagination. Uh, and I think they can often fill in the gaps between A-levels and give that, that rich sort of uh, landscape beyond uh, often the very specialised courses that A-levels include. And I think your ability to juggle these things with the demands of A-level, again, require a degree of resilience. And I think that's, that's really important. There's also a balancing act, I think, between your ability to, to lead, to be something communal, to work together. Um, something I always try and impress upon you know, the, the boys that I teach is, you know, revision, that requires resilience. You know, it's not the most exciting thing, but it's important. And often if you do it as a communal activity, it can be extraordinarily enriching and, and carry you through. Um, your preparation for exams at school, university, whatever, but also you're an individual too, you know, and, and I think that ability to think for yourself and to stand out from the crowd, you know, I think it's very hard being a teenager, um, you know, you, you suddenly or gradually become aware that the, you know, the, the crowd, the group is the thing that you want to be a part of, um, and I was thinking, you know, say to them in assemblies, you know, one of the great things about getting older is you stop worrying what other people think about you. Um, and I think that's really hard for a teenager to do. And again, that, that degree of resilience of being prepared to stand away from the crowd, I think is something which is, which is really important as well. The degree of kind of character which, which goes with that. And you see that too, uh, here's a picture of one of the boarding uh, rooms um, in one of the senior houses. Uh, you know, we're at day school, we end at four, four o'clock, half past five for after school activities. But for boarders, there's a life in the evenings, you know, and again, that degree which you work together and can study together, I think helps develop that sense of you as a group uh, and that sense of resilience. Uh, I was listening to Graham earlier talking about Abingdon, of course, many, many schools are pretty similar. Um, being involved in things outside lessons I think is incredibly important, again, in terms of how you manage your time, but I think also how you kind of develop character. You know, to stand on stage and perform in a play or sing. Uh, this is a Founders Day concert in a st the outdoor stage. Um, great showman, Louis. Um, or indeed, you know, acting together in a, in a concert. Um, I think it's in the Festival Hall um, a couple, about a year ago, uh, where we performed with, with our two other schools in our foundation, Alain's and Jag's uh, combined concert. Um, and sport, you know, being leading a team, you know, how do you, you're losing and how do you try and get your teammates to, to, to renew their effort to prepare for what's going to happen afterwards? I think that all of those things 
help to develop resilience, uh, as does competitions. I think this is, this is house athletics uh, on our track um, taking place. I think if you can get involved in these things and the breadth of what schools like Dulwich and Abingdon have to offer, then I think it helps you to develop that character and how you're going to juggle all those competing demands that you have as a student, as a teenager, um, and ambition. You know, um, I did a PhD and I think one of the most difficult things there was halfway through sort of thinking, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, and finding that sort of st inner steel uh, to, to keep going, to think about it again, and then to find a path through when, you know, you don't have these huge support networks, but by then, through all these other things I've talked about, I think you have found that kind of strength of character, if you like, to do those things which are difficult um, and where you can't necessarily see that there is an end point or by time or by the location or something uh, that, you, that you want to get to. And I think all of those things kind of lead you through to, well, what am I going to do after school? Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, there are lots of questions about that. I mean, I think a lot of people don't really know what they want to do, um, but they can talk to older boys. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? Um, I was going to talk a bit later about the, 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 the Old Boys Association, the Alain Club, and the sense that you know, the connections you can have and the guidance you can have, which I think can be really helpful. So what I thought here was really just to talk a little bit about, I think the questions you as parents probably want to ask in terms of, well, what does the school do to prepare people for their next journey um, after they've left? So at Dulwich, I thought I, you can see all these figures uh, on our website and that the whole list and the subjects they're doing across several years. But I just picked out the biggest universities that we've sent uh, boys to last year. It's changed a little bit from year to year. Um, and I think, you know, I guess one of the questions is, you know, are, is it a school that has experience of sending, uh, or preparing candidates for universities in the UK, outside the UK? Um, we, we, as I said, show you in a minute, you know, have a number of people who prepare uh, boys for, uh, apply to American universities um, and above all that sense of the experience you've got of the types of courses that they're going to do and the types of um, places they're going to go on to. So here at Dulwich um, these are the people involved in, in university applications. Um, I guess one of the things that I would pick out is um, a new appointment, uh, Jake, um, who's just arrived at the college. Um, he's American, his experience is, is in American universities and he's assisting uh, Mr. Ratna Nazabapathy to support boys applying to American universities in particular. Um, and I, as a, as, a, as a teacher, am what's called a UCAS scrutineer. So I've been allocated one form, um, so I've got about 12 boys in it. And not only is the form tutor going through those forms with them, I'm seeing them as a sort of independent person um, it's a science form, most of them applying to read chemistry, engineering, maths at university. I'm a history teacher, but that doesn't matter. It's a sense of, you know, the outward eye looking at those applications, you know, picking out, I don't think that phrase is terribly clear to me. Uh, maybe not being a chemist might be helpful in that sense. And therefore, it's, I think it's that depth of experience and support you as a family and your son will get applying to university, something I think worth having a look at through websites and things and you get a sense of the kind of balance they've got as to, you know where people are going and the types of courses they're doing uh, which I think you should find pretty helpful. We also want people boys to kind of ask questions themselves and so we have various moments of meetings where um, these are two of them um, you can ask questions of people so we have a courses and careers convention in February each year um, that aims really to do two, three things uh, for the younger boys. Um, and I know, you, you know, we're looking at entry maybe at year nine, year 10 is what sort of A-level should I do? Uh, and so all the A-level departments are there. On top of that, there are the universities uh, and also careers companies there. So, you know, if I want to be an architect, how does this all knit together in terms of A-levels, universities, work experience and things 
that I can that I can kind of ask people about. And then we have a festival for overseas universities. You can see a list of the countries and the universities in it that are represented. Um, if you're thinking of, you know, education is now a global commodity. Um, and an increasing number of boys are, are looking at going abroad to do those, those courses. Um, Dulwich Big School, there are about 200, 220 boys in a year group in the upper school. Um, and there are, therefore, I think about 8,000 Old Elanians in London, and we think there are about 12,000, not totally sure, around the world. And I think a good question to ask and look at is the support networks that go with being an alumni of a school. Um, this is from our website. You can have a look at read up about these things in more detail. Um, but the Alain Club is there for all Old Elanians. You know, it's, it's, it's a global thing. There's a Hong Kong branch. Um, when staff go up there, they meet up with OAs in, in Hong Kong. And I think it's that sense of networks, which often connects back to universities. You know, if there are 15 OAs each year going to Bristol, you've got 45 of them, you know, across three years who can support the new, new ones who are coming in. And, and I think that can be really helpful in terms of finding your feet, making sure you're doing the right course, asking the right questions and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, we you know, really want you to come and visit Dulwich. A bit difficult at the moment. Um, there's a virtual tour on our website, um, which will give you a sense of what a lot of spaces on the inside look like, and that's being developed um, further. There's a second phase of that, that, that particular tour being developed in October, so keep having a look at that. Um, we do have a few dates for uh, applications, um, we normally take about 15 boys in at year nine, about five into year 10, and about so 20 to 30 in at 16 plus. Um, these are the applications essentially for the middle school, for, so for years nine and 10. So the deadline for applications is the 2nd of October, and the examination day in Hong Kong will be on the 1st of November. Um, there's a scan a QR card there if you want to kind of get that. Um, have a look on our website. We've got one person in the admissions department dealing specifically with overseas applications. So please, uh, they're called Anita. So please drop Anita a line if you've got any questions. Uh, and we really look forward to hearing from you. And I think we've then got about 10 minutes left for any questions that you may want to ask. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nick, and thank you for your presentation as well. Uh, so we'll begin the Q&A session uh, of your presentation. And to our uh, viewers, if you do have any questions, please do type in your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so I'll begin uh, now. Uh, the first question is, uh, you actually already mentioned that the years of entry at Dulwich. Uh, now, do you accept any other years of entry besides the, the two years you, or three years you just mentioned? Uh, very similar to Abingdon, and we, we, we wouldn't take boys in at year 11 and year 13. There simply isn't time to do the courses that you're going to sit exams in at the end of the, in, in the summer term of those years. We do take a few boys. Uh, there are usually, um, we have a big day entry at 11 plus. Um, we do take some boarders. Uh, there's usually about sort of three or four come in at 11 plus. Um, so... So 11, 13, uh, 14 going into year 10, uh, and 16 for the upper school. Um, we have our own upper school registrar um, who deals with just those 16 plus applications. So there are people who can specifically answer any questions you've got. So the nature of admissions is a little bit different at 16. So you're tested in the subjects that you want to do at A-level, whereas um, in, in uh, year nine, year 10 entry, you will sit papers basically in maths and English, uh, do a reasoning test, um, and uh, those are standard for all entry. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, and next question is, uh, do you guys take um, day school applications from Hong Kong students? We do. Um, so uh, if you're looking for a day place, um, for basically for 13 plus of so year nine entry, that's our big point of entry, 11, 11 plus 13 plus for day boys. Um, the entrance exam is in London. Um, it's usually the last Saturday in January of year eight. Uh, and you would need to be there for that exam then. If you're coming in from overseas, 
uh, we would normally then give you an interview the day before because normally uh, boys sit the entrance exam in late January and then we interview the London boys as it were in early February and obviously the practicalities of, of hanging around or flying backwards and forwards mean that we would interview um, Hong overseas boys looking for a day place in, in that late January slot. Sure, understood. Um, and the, uh, I, I'm just asking, if you're asking about the deadlines and the applications for uh, beyond, this, for beyond next year, are they usually similar each year? They're pretty similar every year. Normally we would, I mean, this year we're not, we send a, a group of staff out to Hong Kong uh, in our October half term, uh, organize meetings, a little bit like this, you know, so people can ask questions and things. Um, we're not doing that this year, but that again, we would be expecting to do that next year. Um, but these dates are pretty standard um, for, for Hong Kong, yeah. Thanks, Nick. Um, the next question is, um, you do have, Dulwich does have a few campuses outside of the UK. Now, uh, for those students that do go to the schools or want to transfer to the schools, for example, the Shanghai schools, um, is there any direct transfer or is there any uh, kind of advantage to be, to go to those schools and then uh, look and want to go into the boarding school in the UK? Uh, no, I mean, all boys, whether they're, you know, what some of the DC schools, uh, say in Shanghai or Beijing or wherever, they would still have to sit our entrance exams. There's no sort of automatic transfer across. Um, obviously, you know, their schools we know, their teachers and their administrative staff are people that we'd know. So in that sense, I guess it's easier for us to pick up the phone and have a chat about them than they would be from other schools. Um, but there's no sense in which they get automatic entry or indeed preferential treatment or anything. You know, they, they would have to sit exactly the same entrance exams into the college that, that anybody else would. Uh, uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, another question is uh, when, uh, I guess this is more of a ge general question, but when people refer to uh, students or boys from Dulwich, uh, what are the key uh, kind of phrases or uh, things that people associate with Dulwich, uh, just a reputation in the UK? Where does it sit? Um, it's, it's obviously, a, it's a big school. It's a well-established school with, you know, a fairly, is fairly academically selective. I think some of its distinctive features would be, it has, and it has for a very long time, had a, a, a large number of boys who are supported to be at the school. Um, so they're on bursaries. So we are socially a much more diverse school than probably quite a lot in our sector, if you like. Um, sure. There's about a third of the boys on some sort of fee relief. Um, as a London day school, uh, we also reflect the population of London, which is, as you know, a pretty kind of global city. Mm -hmm. So as you see probably in a lot of the photographs, you know, they are a pretty diverse bunch of, of boys. And I think we'd like to think they've got their feet firmly on the ground and kind of deal with anybody around them. You know, we don't want them to be too much sort of in a bubble of their own specialness, if you like, you know, and I don't think that's very helpful for the planet. Um, and I think we, the, those character skills are something we think are really important in terms of being future citizens, really. Sure. Uh Thank you. And uh, I believe we may have time for just uh, one more question. Now, uh, just back to admissions again, because we do have a lot of questions about the, that. Uh, now, if a student does get into the school and is given an mm -hmm. offer, how long do you hold that offer for? So the offer that goes out will have, uh, we need to hear back from uh, families uh, within, I think we give them about a month to let us know what they would like to do. They then have to obviously pay a deposit. Um, to secure the place. Um, this year has obviously been somewhat fluid, shall we say, um, in terms of being able to travel around the world. And I think actually the school has been, you know, reasonably flexible in terms of always arriving late, deferring their entry maybe for a term, um, with us trying to support them, obviously with online teaching while they are waiting to come to the college. Um, but generally, I think, you know, you, you, they would, families would have about a month to let us know if Dulwich is a school they wish to accept. Sure. Um, and Nick, I believe uh, that's 
all the time we have for today. I thank you so much for your presentation. Now, before I let you go, do you have any uh, last words for our guests? No, it's, it's been a real pleasure, you know, uh, working with you, you know, uh, you taught me through, as I said to you, I'm not the most technically advanced person. So I'm very grateful to you for, for making sure that it will work so smoothly. So thank you very much. And, and good, good luck to everybody. You know, lots of great schools in Britain. And I'm sure that you'll all find the one that you really feel chimes with you and your family. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for your informative presentation. The yes, next no problem. Yeah. Bye. Bye. The next speaker will be Howard Tuckett, headmaster of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. Howard trained as a teacher in Natal, South Africa. He has taught in independent schools in South Africa, Botswana, England, and now Hong Kong. Over the last 20 years, Howard has been a preparatory school headmaster at St. Joseph's Co College in Suffolk, Caterham School in Surrey, and is currently the founding headmaster of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. Before moving to Hong Kong, Howard served as an ISI inspector and was a governor at two British independent schools. Howard is married with two children. Welcome, Howard. Thank you very much, Helen. And I'm just going to get the right screen, having watched everybody else deal with the technology. There we go. Can you see me all right, Helen? Can you see the screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much, and again, um, a very real thank you to all our speakers, uh, those who've already joined us and those who are yet to come. Um, it's my great pleasure to bring Wickham Abbey Hong Kong to you this afternoon and to be able to talk to you about what is essentially a British prep school uh, that is here in Hong Kong for Hong Kongers. Uh, as you'll see in one of the slides a little later on, we are not an international school in Hong Kong. Wickham Abbey School in Hong Kong is a private school um, and this has a, uh, a, a significance in that we're not restricted at all by any level of quotas of Hong Kongers as, as, a, prepared, as compared to expatriate children. Uh, so we bring an independent British prep school for everybody in Hong Kong, but one that is uh, offering a curriculum based on the British national curriculum so our children follow exactly the same curriculum as they would do in a British prep school in Britain preparing for one of the great schools that you're hearing about but of course we're in Hong Kong so we teach Chinese very well at the same time. Our model of, 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 of pupil that we're, we're envisaging going through this school uh, and time will tell but this is certainly the feedback we're getting are very capable, well-to-do, ambitious Hong Kongers and expatriates going through Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong, either going to one of the great inter, uh, secondary schools in Hong Kong or going off to a, a boarding school in the United Kingdom or possibly even the United States, but ultimately coming back to Hong Kong uh, or this part of Southeast Asia uh, for their adult lives. Of course, everybody's going to have a different story, but this is a kind of model around which we have designed a school, a British prep school for all Hong Kongers. Our original parent school, as you can see in this picture, uh, Wickham Abbey were with us last week. Uh, the headmistress, Jo Duncan, uh, one of her seniors, a former student, and the, the head girl uh, were all on, the, on this webinar this time last week, and we're sharing with you about uh, Wickham Abbey, and I hope that those of you who were with us last week enjoyed that presentation. Wickham Abbey itself is more than 100 years old, and it is one of the leading academic independent schools, or in fact, one of the leading academic schools in the United Kingdom. It is unashamedly an academic school. But as you've heard from the other speakers, uh, as Abingdon referred to uh, the other half, uh, the, the other schools, uh, myself included, as we talk about extracurricular, uh, enriching holistic education. Wickham Abbey in the UK is also a very notable sports school. They're particularly famous for the level of their lacrosse. Uh, they have a, a, a very impressive swimming pool, 20 tennis courts, and so on and so forth. So again, like all of the other schools you're hearing about, Wickham Abbey Girls School, it's a girls school in the UK, only a secondary school. It's all about educating the entire pupil, the young ladies heading off into their adult professional lives. And of course, they go on to great secondary, uh, rather great uh, university options. And, and you can see the notes there, some of the notable universities that they feed into regularly. Here in Hong Kong, uh, we are 
uh, here in Aberdeen on the south side of Hong Kong Island, the main island, uh, and a little town called Tin Wan, which is just off to the side of Aberdeen, uh, as if you're heading round uh, on the prior road round towards Pok Uh We have a, a beautiful campus um, over four floors, and the beauty of this project is that it's a new uh, construction. Uh, it, it's actually been converted from a shopping centre, so it's not a new construction, but it's a new model within an existing construction, and it's designed purely for primary education. We do not have an infant or a kindergarten facility here, and we do not have a secondary facility here beyond the, the age of 13, so going into uh, year nine. So the school runs from British year one, uh, children join us at the age of five, and will run through to year um, eight, so 13 plus. So both of the speakers before me, uh, Nick at uh, Dulwich and Graham at Abingdon, have mentioned that their boarding starts um, at, uh, I think, Dulwich at 11, but certainly boarding starts uh, at Abingdon at 13. And as parents investigating boarding in the UK, again, this is a, a, another little step. Uh, be, be, be very careful not to trip over this one. Do check at which year schools start boarding. Uh, many schools that take day pupils at a younger age group, maybe even have a junior school, may only start boarding at 13. So do uh, check, and of course, by speaking to me here at Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong, or contacting any of these schools directly. Uh, this is one of the very basic points you might just want to check up on. Anyway, back to us here. Uh, we are a co-educational primary school. Important to point out we are co-educational because of course Wickham Abbey in England is a girls' school. Wickham Abbey International here in Hong Kong and with three other uh, big, much bigger schools than this one uh, in mainland China are all co-educational. Um, sometimes other people speak about the school, so they speak about me, so uh, uh, let me tell you a little about myself. Uh, as, as you heard in the introduction, I've been a career prep school teacher and headmaster in the United Kingdom, and it's been one of the privileges of my life uh, to be invited to come here to Hong Kong to found this branch of the Wickham Abbey uh, project, if I may say, to open Wickham Abbey Hong Kong. Uh, we're currently in our second year our second academic year, and the school is flourishing. It's going very well. And I would encourage you to get in touch if you're in Hong Kong uh, and come and have a visit. Let us take you around. Uh, but that's all about me, but I think uh, we've probably said all that already. We believe in teaching the whole child. Um, as both speakers before me have mentioned, we're not just an academic factory. Typical of British independent education, dare I say, one of the finest education models in the world. We know that success comes from having well-adapted children who are confident in themselves. We use the word happy probably too liberally in all senses. We're not looking for happy in terms of just happy tripping around, uh, not doing very much, but we're looking for children who fit their skins who are confident in themselves, have enough um, of a challenge ahead of them to be stimulated, but not so much of a challenge that becomes distracted. And we find that by measuring and assessing the entire child at all stages of their development, because of course child development is a huge part of primary education, in that you're not dealing with the same child at 13 that you dealt with when they were five. They are almost unrecognizable in what they can achieve, what they can do, uh, what their outlook on life. Of course, very young children are very inward looking. It's all about me, me, me. Um, and as they grow up, they become more aware of people around them. And, and so their outlook on life, their view on life uh, changes accordingly. And it's important that we track each of these stages. Now, the 12 points that are in the blue column of, of this slide, these are the 12 objectives that uh, people like Helen and Donna Marie, who, who you've met this afternoon, and our many other colleagues here at the school, we are constantly assessing our children, not only academically, but against these 12 areas, these objectives. How is the child, let's call them, I don't know, Freddie, how is Freddie doing against all of these points at this point in time, whichever year they're in? however they're doing, whatever their family situation is, whatever their academic situation is, whatever their health, uh, their rate of development, how are they tracking against these objectives? And so we can assess the whole child. 
academic assessment. Of course, famously, the bit that you, mum and dad, get to see is what do they get in a test? Well, that's only a very small part of assessment. Uh, in assessment, we're also constantly assessing what a child's cognitive ability is. What is their mental capacity for academic work? Which leads on to telling us how much we can reasonably expect from each child, which allows us to set the appropriate level of academic challenge so that we're drawing them along by offering the right level of academic challenge so that it is still a challenge, it's still hard, they've got to do the, uh, as um, Nick was saying just now, they've got to do the revision, they've got to sit down and do the hard stuff, but what we're asking them to do isn't impossible. It's been pitched at just the right level of challenge for them so that if they do engage well, if they are studying as they've been taught to study, if they are well supported, they will achieve and they will experience success. And boy, there's nothing like success for stimulating somebody. Nobody does well in life if they've been constantly beaten down. Anybody will do well in life if they have experienced success and they've just got that huge boost of energy because they've really done something significant and now they're ready to move on to the next challenge. This is how we entice and support children through their primary education, helping them to become expert learners so that when they get to these great secondary schools, either here in Hong Kong or the UK or wherever else they may go, they have the toolkit, they have the mental strength, the mental agility, and they've experienced what it means to engage uh, with a challenge at school and achieve real success. As I've already said, uh, we are a private school, not an international school, and I spoke a little about our curriculum. We follow a curriculum based on the British National Curriculum, the National Curriculum for England and Wales, and it's been tempered. I know this because I was the one who, who has had the privilege of being able to put our curriculum together. I tempered it with the Common Entrance curriculum. Now, parents, uh, Common Entrance is, if you like, the standard 11 plus examination. Very few schools, independent schools, actually use Common Entrance in its fullest sense. All of them are aware of it, and all of them tend to refer to it to get the level that they're going to set their 11 plus and 13 plus entry examinations at. Um, it's so, sometimes you know, people who are teaching you know, much older children, maybe sixth form all the time, are not quite sure where to pitch uh, a, a real um, effective 11 plus examination for maybe children five, six years older than the older teenagers they're teaching. And so of course, common entrance gives them a very good uh, sounding board, a very good standard. Um, there are some schools that use common entrance in its purest form. Other schools, many of them, I would say the majority, tend to use their own 11 plus and 13 plus assessments. But the common entrance gives us a really good syllabus for preparing children for 11 plus and 13 plus. The common entrance syllabus is not different to the national curriculum of England and Wales, but it's enriched. It expects more detail. It expects more engagement, uh, if you like, than the standard uh, curriculum. And then the third strand of the curriculum uh, that I brought in, uh, in, in meshing, if you like, a three strands of, of three great curricula to offer this uh, Wickham Abbey Hong Kong curriculum, the third strand I brought in was from the local Hong Kong EDV primary curriculum. Another wonderful curriculum, really rich, really broad. It offers a lot. It challenges at just the right levels, and it's very well thought out. Having read it in great detail, I'm a great fan of it. So by merging the EDB primary curriculum, the British, the English net curriculum for England, Wales, and the common entrance enrichment of that, I've woven all three together. And this is the curriculum that we follow. On the next slide, you'll see the subjects we cover. So our curriculum is bespoke, it's tailor-made, and it comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, that we offer a British prep school for Hong Kong children. Children at Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong, will follow exactly the same curriculum as children in Britain do at all the great prep schools there in preparation for British boarding schools. And of course, that also prepares them for the great schools that are in Hong Kong. And many of those head teachers and myself are in contact with each other. Ultimately, we intend to build our own secondary school and plans are afoot to bring Wickham Abbey Secondary School, which will be a co-educational day and boarding school with a separate junior school attached to it, in addition to this one, up in the new territories. 
Um, discussions are going on about the site at the moment, but that will take some years to come through. So here are the subjects that we teach. English and Chinese take about half the week's teaching time. We have such an investment in the teaching of Chinese, but we are not a bilingual school. We are an English medium school. English is spoken throughout the school all the time, unless we're in a Chinese lesson. We have dedicated exactly the same amount of time to Chinese in terms of teaching time as we do to English. And in addition to that, we pump two teachers into every lesson every day for every class when, when it's time for Chinese. So children are doing high quality Chinese every day. We are already well into our second year. The feedback is that children are making as good, if not better progress. Those that have moved to us from government primary schools but they are moving, certainly not dropping behind, and some of them are going faster than they were before, but we're using this much more holistic, dare I say, less pressurized, uh, less intense uh, way of teaching Chinese. And I'll come on to a little more detail about that in a moment. The model for the teachers we employ is that they should be trained in the United Kingdom or somewhere similar. In other words, that they should have trained and be experienced in a teaching environment that is either on the British national curriculum or in a country that is similar. And similar countries would be Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, and even some of the states of the United States, but the, the various states uh, do vary. When we started the school just over a year ago, half the staff uh, were physically moved out from England. The other half of the teaching staff were all British trained teachers or similar, who were already in Hong Kong and were coming to the end of contracts at other schools and moved to us. So our core teaching team are mostly British trained teachers, a couple of rogues like myself who were trained in South Africa, Australians, New Zealanders, um, and of course the Chinese teaching team who uh, are either from mainland China or from Hong Kong and trained there and bring their expertise and their specialism uh, to us. Part of the teaching, as you will appreciate from the earlier slides I showed you, it's not just about the academics. Part of the teaching is all about supporting the whole child. So you'll see on this slide that it's absolutely critical that we have a supportive classroom environment. Our classrooms are not places where children are scared to be or anxious to come to. They look forward to them. Uh, the news that we've been able to open uh, next week has been received so gratefully uh, by the, all the pupils who we've had online every day. We're particularly pleased that we've been able to open for full days. Uh, we're able to open for full days for our year six, five, fours and threes uh, next week and the following week, like other schools in Hong Kong, our second uh, wave of entry will come from our junior children, our year twos and ones. But Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong is open for full day teaching uh, from next week and we're delighted to be able to offer that to Hong Kong. And part of that full day care is looking after children for a full day, giving them that well-rounded pastoral uh, care that we're looking after the whole person for all the reasons I mentioned before. Um, I think I've probably covered everything that's on this slide in that we're a British school, uh, a British based model school. We speak English as the medium of instruction, but Chinese is taught very well. Um, and you can see the points here and, and do come back to us. Do please get in touch. At the end of this conversation, uh, there will be a slide with all our contact details and uh, by virtue of the fact you're on the webinar, you know how to get hold of us. So do please get in touch. We have a separate whole webinar on how we teach Chinese um, and our head of Chinese, our deputy head, uh, Ms. Jenny Chen, will be very happy to speak to you. But you can see the main points uh, here on this slide. Of course, being a prep school, uh, a significant part of our role is helping those children who are going off to these great British boarding schools to help them prepare. Uh, this slide is taken from a school who actually aren't joining us today. This is Priors Field, um, a wonderful girls school in Surrey. Uh, a good friend of mine here um, is the, in the picture, is uh, the resident housemaster. He and his wife uh, run the boarding. And you can see two girls who are international boarders at Priors Field here. You can always tell Priors Field with their bright green and pink, pink colors. Um, and, and coming back to us and how we prepare your children to enter schools like all the wonderful schools we've been hearing from, it's part of what we do. The critical point is if we know we've got a child preparing for British boarding and we already have quite a lot, 
We don't put them on some special program. We don't have to find them extra coaching. We don't have to do this, that, or the next thing because they've got some big challenge that we don't know how to deal with. Everything we've got at this school and everything we do at this school will prepare a child for entry to British independent schools, whether they're day schools or boarding schools or to any of the great uh, secondary schools here in Hong Kong or mum and dad, wherever your career is going to take you, Singapore, Australia, the States, Canada, wherever you're going, I'm talking to heads around the world uh, every week as we look at transfer options. And of course, there's a lot of information to be gleaned and we can help you with that. One of the best points to start with when you're considering schools is to consider the fact that, of course, one, one of the big fears that we have as parents is we're looking at sending our children halfway around the world to these schools. Some of them are very old. They've got beautiful buildings, great reputations, but there's no getting around it. Britain and Hong Kong are quite different cultures to each other. It's asking a lot of an 11-year-old or a 13-year-old to move halfway around the world, leave home, and just drop into one of these uh, sometimes quite intimidating, uh, beautiful campuses. Um, and just expect them to get on with it. It takes a lot of preparation. And we're working with parents and pupils for years, five, six years of age. Once parents think they want to know a little about how this might work, we go to work together with parents, uh, helping them prepare. One of the things, mum and dad, to know about British boarding schools is that they are very well regulated. All of these schools belong to professional organizations. You can see um, some of the key ones listed on the banner below. And those organizations are so highly thought of by Her Majesty's Inspector, by Ofsted, that they actually have their own independent schools inspectorate called the ISI. You've heard the ISI mentioned several times this afternoon. Uh, Graham May is an ISI inspector. I'm an ISI inspector. And various other people who you've heard of uh, who also work for the ISI. These schools are so well regulated. There is a, uh, a document um, of boarding school regulations, uh, which, which is pages and pages thick, and every school has to um, fulfill and, and surpass these regulations, and the ISI are very hot. Every school's website will have its latest ISI inspection on it. If you're looking at schools, if you're considering schools, one of the things you have to do, would be my advice, is go and find their latest inspection reports, probably the last two, because there, there are two types of inspection and one follows after the other. So actually two reports give you a full picture. Um, and if you need any help interpreting those inspection reports or what does this mean, what does that mean? If you're not sure, do please get in touch with me. I'd be happy to uh, host you here at Wickham Abbey. We'd have a cup of coffee together and I would take you through the ISI report. So as we help you prepare your child, we're going through all of these things in the red blocks, helping you select schools, helping you with your application strategy, uh, helping you prepare for interview. Of course, entry to these schools is not just about academics. Uh, the interviews, as you would have picked up from, from Graham and Nick, uh, schools are interested in the whole person, the whole person. And as we hear from Harry Hammond and, and from William Reese, who are going to be speaking after me, and indeed from Jen Ma. Uh, who's, who's the speaker after me, they'll be talking to you about this holistic application process. The ac academics are very important, but there are other aspects to the, uh, the uh, entry procedure and uh, interview forms quite a large, it's, interview is, is a good practical method for the schools to find out more about the children they're looking for places for. So do parents be advised to pay as much attention preparing for these other aspects of entry as well as just the academics. Um, we have members of staff here, and here's a bit of a meeting, helping our pupils who are thinking about boarding. And this discussion going on here with our, our member of staff here and, and two of our pupils is all about what it's going to be like to be a boarder, what things do we need to start thinking about. You can see they're still quite young and they're a year or two away from leaving us to going off to British boarding schools. Um, but we are supporting the children all the way through. Our school, of course, offers all kinds of uh, uh, primary excellence. You can see the school hall here on the right. You can see the cutaway building. Um, in other slides, these are two of our classrooms. Uh, Helen Wood, who's on the call at the moment, you can see her famous stripy tent uh, in her here one classroom. Um, and do go onto our website. We have a virtual tour on the website, which was uh, constructed by our Versa, Jeremy Young. It's, it's a wonderful uh, example of the model of the virtual tours. 
and you can go all through the school and there are helpful little video clips uh, to help you see uh, and find out more about our school. But of course, none of that would actually uh, be preferable to you. Uh, oh, there, there we are, this is our drone racing room. The children race drones that they're building through these hoops. It's a bit like electronic Quidditch. Um, but do, do come and visit us. This is our rooftop uh, garden outdoor area uh, we use for outdoor activities. Our school day, pretty normal school day really. Uh, we start teaching just after eight. The school day finishes at three. And then we have two one hour extracurricular activity uh, sessions every day. And we're offering in the region of, of 30, I think it's now 32, uh, extracurricular activities. Again, reinforcing all the things that the previous two speakers have talked about, as well as our very broad holistic day. We offer all of these activities and clubs. The thought is, um, parents, you might be relieved to know, we've designed a school where your child comes to school in the morning, and when they get home in the evening after five o'clock, they've done all their lessons, they've done all the clubs, activities, music, rock climbing, dancing, singing, taekwondo. They've also done their homework because homework period is also available in the after school activities. You can sign up and go to homework club. You can come home, your homework's done and your evening is for the family. The application process is really simple. Um, do, do just contact us. You'll see the, the uh, contacts at the end of this presentation. Um, we do put children through an academic assessment. We are, are, we are an academically rigorous school and we need to know that it's going to be fair to the child, that they will be able to keep up. Um, so uh, that, I think we've already covered that point and there are our contact details. Wallace, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, I believe we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Howard. Yes, so we'll begin the Q&A session now and I'll start asking some of these questions. Uh, first one is, um, we see that year one to year six is offered at Wickham Abbey School. Will you be opening year seven and year eight? And what about senior school plans? Yes, thank you. So um, year seven and year eight will be opening next year, key stage three, um, so that we follow this, this standard British prep school model that children can stay with us and go off to their senior schools at 11. But if, like I was saying, they're going to a boarding school, particularly that starts at 13, they can stay with us and prepare for entry at 13 plus here in Hong Kong. You wouldn't need to go to a British prep school just for the last two years, but it's probably going to be quite hard to break into the group of children just for those last two years. They can stay here in Hong Kong with us, prepare for their entry to their senior school and leave us at 13. Um, and as I said a little earlier, we, we are uh, looking to build a secondary school. If you want an idea of what our secondary school would look like, the sort of size of campus I'm talking about, do have a look at our Wickham Abbey Changzhou uh, website and you'll see that we're talking about vast campuses, loads of sports fields. All of the Wickham Abbeys have water frontages. Uh, rowing uh, is offered at all of the Wickham Abbey schools and I, I shouldn't think ours would be any different. Uh, so for something that big, it's going to have to be in the new territories. And the final discussions to actually agree on the site are taking place at the moment. And we hope to be able to make an announcement about our senior school project uh, very soon. Uh, thank you, Howard. Uh, the next question is, uh, you mentioned earlier the subjects that are uh, being taught at Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong. Now, um, what, are these sub uh, what years are these subjects offered at? Thank you. Yeah, all subjects are offered at all years age appropriately. So by age appropriately, uh, we don't teach history as a discrete subject uh, in year one, but there is a history content and it's blended with the geography and the religious education and it's called content. Um, and all of the topics that are listed under those subjects separately, the teachers very expertly blend them in to sort of bite-size um, projects uh, that, that younger children can, can um, work with and as I said before, experience some success, give them a good grounding to when these subjects a little later on in the timetable become discrete um, lessons at about year three and year four. Thank you, Howard. Um, and I do think we have time for about one more question. Now, uh, last question is, how is the admission process like and are you currently taking immediate transfers? Uh, yes, our admissions process, we work very hard at it. In fact, Wallace, Wallace is asking me the questions, is in charge of it. Um, we've worked really hard to make sure that our admissions process is as easy as possible. When I came to Hong Kong, I was quite surprised to find how hard and how stressful it is to get into schools. And I determined to make it as easy and as stress-free as possible. The first thing we did to remove stress was we took all the money out of it. 
Application to Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong is free. Assessment to Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong is free. And if I have my way, it'll stay that way. We don't need to be taking money from people just to assess their children. At the moment, we're a developing school. Our school is growing very fast. It has trebled in size in, in just its first year. Um, we now have three years, three classes in year one. We have three classes uh, in year two, and I'm about to split year three and year four into, into multiple classes as well. Um, at the moment, though we have places in most years, uh, probably less so in year one and two at the moment, those are filling fast. In the older years, we have places still, but that situation isn't going to last forever. So I think to come to Wickham Abbey now, um, the, the decision is, is it morally right for the child to come to the school? Are they going to cope? And it'll be a yes or a no based on that. But already by this time next year, I anticipate that the question is going to be, I've got six children in one place, which child is doing best? And it will become competitive by necessity, like all other good internet, uh, independent schools do. Thanks, Wallace. Thank you, Howard. Uh, and I believe that's all the time we have for uh, this presentation. Now, before I let you go, uh, do you have any words for our guests? Well, certainly, yes. Uh, thank you for your time this afternoon, everybody. Um, and do enjoy the, the rest of the uh, presentation, the rest of the webinar. It's been a great pleasure to collate all of this together to find all these speakers uh, for you. And I hope you found it useful. And do please use us. We are a British prep school here in Hong Kong for you, for all Hong Kongers, to help your primary age children prepare for their secondary life, no matter where that may be. And that includes an expertise in preparing them for entry to British independent schools. Uh, do look on the website, do contact us here, and I look forward very much uh, to meeting you. So many people from the previous two Saturdays have emailed me, phoned me up uh, over the last two weeks with all kinds of questions, and I've been delighted, even though you're not actually at the school, delighted to sort of point you in the right direction and, and, and suggest who you might speak to here in Hong Kong or in the UK. So I'm going to hand over now, I believe Jennifer Ma from Arch Education is following me. And I know you're going to enjoy her talk. And thank you very much. And I'll see you all right at the end of this afternoon's webinar. Thank you so much, Howard, for your very helpful, clear and informative presentation and for outlining the very diverse and holistic curriculum offered at Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong. Our next speaker will be Jennifer Ma, the co-founder and director of Arch Education. Jennifer Ma attended top schools, St. Paul's Co-Educational College in Hong Kong, and Benningdon School in the UK before graduating from the University of Oxford with first class honours in economics and management. Jennifer achieved her master's degree in education at the University of Hong Kong and is a co-author of the bestseller Boarding Schools, All You Need to Know. Jennifer is a Benningdon School trustee, China Oxford Scholarship Fund panelist and is part of the University of Oxford, Prembrook, College, Ossulston Circle. At Arch, Jennifer is responsible for the development of enrichment programmes. She leads the UK and Hong Kong consultation teams which specialise in applications for Oxbridge and professional subjects including medicine, law and architecture. Welcome Jennifer Ma. Thank you very much Howard and Donna Marie. Um, can you hear me? Yes, and can you see my presentation? Yes. Thank right, you. I just want to check to make sure. Okay, um, uh, hello all parents and students. Thank you very much to Wickham Abbey Hong Kong for inviting me to deliver this presentation. Um, and I'm very excited to share on the more practical side of the preparation process in applying to UK uh, boarding schools. So um, I myself went at the age of 12 and my brother went at the age of um, 10. So we are definitely champions and uh, advocates of the UK system. So today, um, Oops, let me just see. Okay, so I'll go through a quick introduction of Arch so, so that you understand where our experience comes from. Um, and then um, the, the bulk of the presentation would be on the latest insights of trends and what have changed for the top boarding school admissions um, as the top boarding schools would set, would set the trend for how UK boarding schools in general um, uh, uh, assess students. 
be it timeline changes, the layers of testing, the diversity of actual assessment coverage, interview questions, which a lot of parents ask about, and uh, progression of pathways that uh, one would, might want to take into account. Then I will wrap up by talking about the six step preparation if parents are um, hoping to apply for uh, some of these more selective UK boarding schools. ASH does a lot of things. Um, our mission is to bridge the education gaps um, in skills. So we do thinking, speaking, reading, writing programs for students aged seven to 14. Um, we also help students prepare for um, boarding schools and universities abroad. Today, we'll be focusing on boarding schools. Um, and then we're also the only education center in Asia that is approved by a university. So we're the teaching faculty of University of London. Uh, what that means is, um, well, sorry, the registered teaching institution of University of London. What that means is all the results we publicly share have to be 100% accurate. So, um, so some of the results over the past uh, eight, nine years, um, uh, a lot uh, of great results into universities, but very interesting last year um, in particular, we got 93% of our students who um, engage us for ongoing guidance into top boarding schools in the UK, um, got into the top 11 boarding schools with 85% of them getting unconditional offers or scholarships. So today, uh, we'll be sharing on how we help these students who really come from many different backgrounds uh, and we help them bridge the pathways and here's uh, here are some examples so whether it's directly from local schools or international schools to UK US universities or those who actually transition between local to international or those who actually transition um, to boarding schools first before going abroad in the same region and the most complex cases would be those who go abroad to one region for boarding school then switch to another region for university. So in any case, um, it really takes uh, our expertise to help parents and students navigate the transition process. Um, so we tend to take a macro view of students' pro profiles in accounting for long-term considerations. What that means is uh, we don't just advise students just because they want to go to a particular region that, uh, you know, uh, to, to help them prepare for that particular region. We take a macro view to see if that region is actually right for them, whether they should actually consider other regions, um, should they even stay in Hong Kong for a bit longer before they go abroad, are they ready? So much more macro view. Um, also, we have our own UK senior consultants who are themselves uh, former heads of schools and um, boarding schools and prep schools who go around schools in the UK for annual visits. Um, we are definitely on the preparation side as opposed to the processing side. So we're not an agent, so we don't help with all the for, uh, filling in the forms, but uh, we, our expertise lies with helping students um, ace the preparation for the academic side um, of the assessments. Um, of course, because we are not agencies, we do not represent any schools and we don't take commission from any schools. So our recommendations tend to be very objective. Um, university application students uh, are really our first hand insights because we help a lot of them apply for universities. So what that means is, uh, and they're currently uh, students at boarding schools to so give us a lot of insights as to what's exactly happening currently at some of these schools. So boarding school admissions, um, the latest insights of trends, I'll go through each one of them one by one. So here are just some of the more selective schools, um, but there are many, and uh, Wicked Maybe Hong Kong has managed to invite many of them to join this I festival. Um, the top few are all boys, uh, the middle few are all girls, and then the bottom few are examples of uh, co-ed schools. So they really um, uh, uh, differ by gender, by size, by um, environment, uh, environmental um, exposure. Some of them are actually in cities, some of them are in rural areas. Um, the history could be very different, even the architectural design is very different, curriculum is very different, university destinations could, uh, could vary. So for example, Seven Oaks is very international. Uh, uh, nearly 20-30% of them go to other regions to pursue universities. Now all this actually does reflect in the admissions process um, because they will be looking for, as Howard mentioned just now, a different a personality or a particular fit, what they call a particular spark in a child. So whether your child is right for the, for the school, the school will also assess that for themselves. But then uh, when it comes to admissions, um, all these schools are also different by number of places they have on offer each year. Um, the selectiveness um, could vary. Selection criteria can be different. Assessment types are different. But most importantly, the time frame for pre-registration is also different. So a lot of parents get very confused, even with the actual logistical timeline. Um, and we have had students who apply to all girls schools, for example, in the UK and ending up having to fly four times in four months just to, uh, um, just to attend these um, assessment days. 
So first of all, let's talk about timeline requirements and how they differ. So um, just taking all boys schools as an example, as you can see, um, depending on the school, they may have different um, assessment stages. Usually they start with a pre isap test, which has become much more popular these days um, um, uh, to assess students at a young age of 10. Um, and then they may have a school pretest where um, it's actually a, a, an exam set by the school. Um, then they may do interviews and then some schools may do common entrance or proprietary papers, either just for a setting purpose or actually for, um, for further selection. So some schools like Heron Tunbridge uh, would use agencies uh, for the processing and most of these other uh, more selective schools don't use agencies. So as you can see, um, especially for boys, um, they do, uh, they could assess earlier despite them going at the age of 13, 14, they may be assessed at age 10, 11. And that's why the prep schools uh, in the UK and in particular Hong Kong with Wickham Abbey Hong Kong is really good at preparing these students uh, for, uh, for, for these, um, uh, the transition into these a top secondary schools in the UK. Um, and as you can see just from this timeline, and it's a real timeline from a student who is going uh, to school this year, um, he actually started preparation as early as 2017, so three, four years before, because um, uh, all the pre-tests and all the interview dates and all the assessments are uh, at different times. So um, it's important that parents are aware uh, before applying. Uh, multi layers of testing, um, as you understand, Hong Kong is very much this kind of local school environment. So uh, it's pretty much uh, uh, all assessments are based on grades. But if you look at um, studying abroad, um, it's very much this kind of Harkness table, U-shaped table, discussion-based learning. And that is why um, uh, schools are looking for much more than just grades. They want students to participate. They want them to have the skill sets to survive and enjoy, uh, most importantly, the, uh, the new learning environment. So look at many things. Obviously, grades uh, would, would be um, uh, something as indication, but honestly, for UK boarding schools, not all of them are able to decipher all the different school transcripts and gradings uh, amongst all the different schools in Hong Kong. So they often would have these standardized test scores or these extra examinations like pre ISEP, UKSET, or school proprietary papers to kind of calibrate um, students' abilities um, uh, when they assess them. So it's, it's more of a fair process and also to ensure that the students' uh, abilities are in line with the UK standards. Um, essays, especially for sixth form entry, they'll be asking students to write some personal statements, essays, um, extracurricular activities. Uh, of course, boarding schools, especially UK, they really want the students to be able to immerse and enjoy all facets of boarding school life. So actually having engagements with extracurricular activities will give schools a reassurance that the child will be able to immerse and adapt to the new school setting. Um, and of course, many schools also offer scholarships. So if there's a particular area of talent, then um, students can also go for scholarships. Um, interviews are in a different bubble because as I'll share more later, um, uh, it comes in different formats and questions could be very different, but all of them for UK boarding schools are um, conducted by the actual admissions officers, if not sometimes even the director of studies um, and headmistress, headmasters. Um, teacher recommendations and transcripts are also important, uh, but then because there are interviews, a lot of these schools actually take the interviews more seriously than on paper reference. Diversity of assessments, um, many different types of assessments, and they're not all required by all schools, depending on school, depending on age, depending on potentially what subject they may go for if, uh, at university, if they are older students applying for 16 plus, but usually there'll be English comprehension, composition, maths, reasoning, verbal, non-verbal reasoning for the younger age. And sometimes they will add sciences for some schools and occasional schools may have a comprehensive set of assessments, including linguistics, history, RS, and general paper. Um, so with our 10 years of experience working with um, students every year applying for these schools, um, some of these common gaps for students in Hong Kong, be it uh, local or international, at times uh, the gap is wider for local school students simply because of um, First one for English is just skill gaps. A lot of times students are not exposed to the type of comprehension questions, the type of standards. Um, they may be more, uh, uh, for example, prone to writing um, descriptive writing, but perhaps less analytical writing. And some schools may ask these more advanced questions um, at a young age in the UK. 
Um, exam techniques, of course, will need some exposure there as well. Maths, most Hong Kong students are usually stronger, but then um, there is that curriculum gap. If you're not following the English UK curriculum, then there are just simply some areas that is not taught at school. So even the very, very bright students um, may not have been exposed. English terminology, so they may know the maths, but if it's asked in English, they may not understand the question. Reasoning, um, these questions are not as uh, usual kind of type of questions that students in Hong Kong would have come across. So they definitely need exposure to understand at least the fundamental uh, mentality to approach these questions. They are aptitude tests, which means uh, it will come to a point where, you know, even extra tutoring or extra assessments will not help the students improve. But if they have a bit of exposure and practice, then definitely they can get more used to understanding how to tackle these questions. Um, sciences, again, curriculum gap. A lot of schools in Hong Kong for primary age don't even do sciences properly or actually have it as a separate subject. Um, so it's quite impressive uh, having visited Wickham Abbey that they have a very strong science and STEM um, provision. Um, again, linguistics, history, RS, general paper, um, the curriculum may not be covered in Hong Kong local system. Just to show you what verbal reasoning means, is basically these patterny type of questions, uh, really honing on vocabulary, at times grammar. Um, Nonverbal, a lot of these like spatial awareness type of questions, it's kind of a, the bedrock of quantitative ability, spatial awareness, when you do physics and math down the line, you have to be able to visualize. Uh, in fact, some subjects like engineering or like medicine, when it comes to an older age group of students applying for universities, they also use exactly the same assessments. Um, so we've done a lot of research uh, in, in, in the back end at Arch. I can't show you these uh, results now in, on PowerPoint through Zoom, but different schools' proprietary papers may entail a slightly different syllabus and exam focus. So we do a lot of research to make sure that, you know, depending on which school the kid goes for, um, that we are definitely tailored to their preparation. Interview questions format. So this is often a, an area parents ask if I'm very nervous about because obviously it's not something that's so easily controlled because it depends on the child's performance on a day. Um, it's getting a bit more varied. Um, uh, oftentimes now top schools invite students to fly over um, because they actually want the child to take a look at the environment themselves as well. Um, it's, it's important that the child likes the school because ultimately it's not just studying, but you're living there. Um, so being comfortable is important. Being able to immerse in the culture. And so a lot of them do weekend interviews, group activities, group interviews, just to see how they, how they, um, uh, um, you know, conduct themselves in the school setting. But of course, uh, this is not the luxury that all schools can afford or all parents can afford. So um, schools often also fly over to Hong Kong um, to interview students in person on a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, but general questions um, could cover many different types. Personal standard questions like, you know, why UK boarding? Do you feel you're ready? Why you want to leave the your current school, etc. Debate over controversial topics. We have come across students who mentioned that they really want to study history and pick history as a GCSE, and the school would then counter counter question her, you know, but why do you think you need to take history? Can't you just do that on the side? So it's more like um this debating type of questions to see if a student can actually justify their, uh, their, their, their thoughts. Um, impromptu literature, poetry analysis, uh, this is quite common for some of these schools that are a bit more academic and traditional. So they actually give you a poem on the spot to read and analyze and discuss with you just to see if your uh, impromptu um, um, analysis or uh, uh, discussion is good because that's exactly how they would conduct uh, teaching in um, the UK. Um, alternatives like you know, bring an object from home and share a little bit with, uh, share share a little bit about it with me. So it's more about getting to know your personality, abstract questions, see how you can think outside the box. Um, current affairs, um, you know, for example, if you could uh, invite someone to dinner, three people, dead or alive, um, who would you invite? Okay, so really just to see if a student um, is able to. Uh, bring about people who might be current affairs related or their personality interest related uh, engage in that conversation. So uh, again, of course, through all this, it's really about presentation skills and to see if you can bring out uh, the student's uh, personality in a natural way at interview. Just an example here, um, just, to, just to round off this, this, this part, 
what is this painting trying to tell you? This is really a question posed to one of my 10 year old students at a relatively top selective all girls school. And honestly, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, they may have seen this picture, they may have not, but it doesn't really matter. And after the student shared her view, then they asked her, you know, if you were to um, give this painting a topic, a title, a name, what would it be? So, um, so quite interesting how they uh, uh, seek out uh, the, the child's um, thinking process. So six step preparation, as mentioned earlier, um, this year we, we, we ongoing guided 40 students, really quite bespoke. We don't take on more than 40, just simply because it is a lot of energy needed to work with these 10 year olds. So I have a lot of respect for schools that, uh, that, that work with many more. Um, so we've got 93% of the most selective 11 boarding schools, they're all boys, all girls, and a few co-ed schools. So let's see uh, what we would advise to students and parents to do. Whether or not you engage a consultant doesn't matter, but you, you should um, think about these six steps. The first is uh, we always meet parents and children together to really understand their education aspiration and past planning. So if the student, you know, in the right curriculum currently in Hong Kong, maybe actually staying in Hong Kong is better for them. Um, what's the student's longer term aspiration? Do they have any profession in mind? Um, or any subject in particular in mind, because that may Im even impact whether they should leave earlier or later for boarding school. Um, is US an option? You know, um, uh, even the mindset of the parent uh, will, will determine what kind of school they may want to um, uh, focus on. Um, again, as mentioned earlier, the timeline is very, very confusing. So what schools they're they are aiming for and when they need to prepare for what kind of exam or interviews. Um, we really um, promote students to not just engage in one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is honestly quite a, um, it could be quite a mundane uh, process for a nine to 11 year old. And it's, it's quite a, it could be quite passive. It's very effective, but relatively passive. So we do a lot of group class um, teaching to inspire students to think um, in, in teams and also to engage in the discussion-based learning because that is, that is basically a prequel uh, preparation for interviews and also to help them immerse into the teaching uh, and learning environment in the UK. So Socrates is actually our flagship program on thinking. So we ask lots of op uh, open-ended questions and I encourage parents to also do that with your child. Questions like, you know, um, uh, why are planes usually white, usually, right? But don't give me two reasons, give me five. And it gets really hard and it gets uh, students really thinking why people take planes, etc. So uh, we have a lot of uh, such specialist teach tutors in Hong Kong and UK, many with Oxbridge backgrounds, um, offering on-site and online tutoring across all subjects um, uh, and across all ages. So um, that allows us to tailor students' preparations for different schools. Uh, we also have our own mock papers because um, some of our students are very diligent and they do, they, they do all the papers available to be bought in bookstores. So we actually have our own papers to further assess um, their abilities. Uh, by invitation and depending on whether the student needs it, we also do these kind of like passion projects to really highlight a student's passion in a particular area. So for example, the last one here, Superhero and Max, is actually done by a 12 year old. Um, she, he came, uh, his mom said, you know, he's really talented in Max, but he, and he actually didn't want to do more math because he found it irrelevant at school. Um, so we ended up doing a project with him to disprove the reality of superhero through using math. Um, so uh, hopefully then to help them get into the top schools possible. The one in the middle is actually really interesting. He got basically kicked out of schools in Hong Kong joined Socrates and we realized he's actually quite talented and he was really um, interested in the concept of power. So we did a whole uh, thing on Ottoman power, you know, the Greek power, Roman Empire, and um, and he's now actually at Winchester. So um, so with that, I think I'm up with my 20 plus minutes of sharing. So uh, I talked a little bit about Arch, what we do and our insights, um, why, you know, top UK boarding schools are attractive and, um, uh, and how they're different uh, by assessments and is really you know, reflective of if you're going for the more selective schools where assessments are needed, what's, what are the latest trends? Um, and lastly, the six step preparation uh, for parents to consider if you are applying for these schools in the UK. So if you're interested, contact us and we can meet you for an hour and your children as well to assess uh, the best possible preparation path. Thank you. Thanks, Jen, uh, and thank you for all these uh, insights. Um, now we'll begin the uh, Q&A session, and I'll begin with the first question. Um, so the first question is, um, 
which schools ask for the UK ISET or ISEB? And is there any consistency or is it usually random? Yeah, well, I can't um, list out all the schools right now. So I think that the first qualifying uh, response, because I don't want to be inaccurate and miss out any schools, is do check with each school. Um, but some schools actually make you consent compulsory and some schools it's just for reference. Um, and um, I think the very, very top schools are increasingly using pre-ISEP. Um, it is still is also a computerized test. Um, it's because they find the nonverbal and verbal reasoning and um, you know reflective of students' abilities. Um, so for the pre-ISEP uh, uh, examinations, most, if not all, the all boys schools, for example, use it. And for example, Wellington also uses it. Um, a few of the uh, top all girls schools like Benenden also uses the pre-ISEP now. So the, the the most accurate response to this question is to check with each school. Um, because I can't list out um, all the schools um, here. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, and the next question is, um, does ARCH offer help for getting financial aid or scholarships? And overall, are these difficult to attain for Hong Kong students since we are overseas entries? Yeah, we have been uh, very successful uh, over the years helping students apply for university scholarships because these are all you know, public scholarships. For, um, for boarding school scholarships, it really depends on the child uh, because it's very school specific. Um, and some schools like Cheltenham College, for example, offer six or seven different types of scholarships. They even have like digital scholarship. Winchester is doing like sports scholarship uh, when most people think Winchester is very academic. So there are different scholarships offered at school. We actually helped Radley um, establish their scholarship just for Hong Kong students. And, um, and it's a six year scholarship, fully funded, a very generous one. So different scholarships have different um, offering as well. Some is just a token financial scholarship. Some is really needs based. So um, this year we had a lot of students being offered scholarships. So they do the regular assessments did really well and got invited to sit the scholarship paper and you may fail the scholarship paper but you still might get in as a regular student or you may do well in the scholarship paper but those scholarship um, uh, tend to be more like token merit-based as opposed to need-based which would be a larger amount uh, thank you Jen um, and the next question is um, many of these schools are, are testing for English and mathematics uh, for entrance but some of these other schools for example Undol school uh, requires year seven candidates to take science exams. Uh, first, um, since there's no syllabus for science in Hong Kong primary schools, how can they pre get prepared for these, uh, you know, these exams? And then in addition to that, how does ARCH help uh, these students prepare? Yeah, um, uh, so one way would be referencing Key Stage, which is exactly what Wickham Abbey is offering. Um, because it's actually quite a, quite a set syllabus um, on science, even for primary school. And, um, but one thing is that uh, the UK examination question um, format or the way they ask questions is a little bit different because they're more exper experimental. So whereas Hong Kong is more technical, whereas in the UK, they sometimes actually expect students to have done some experiments. So that part actually will need students to do a bit more practicum, so which, which we can't help. But if they're in a school setting like yourself, then they can actually um, engage in these experiments along the way as well. Thank you, Jen. Um, and to follow up on that question, um, how early should uh, parents be uh, preparing for their child uh, if they're in interested in boarding school entry? And uh, in addition to that, when they're applying, should they usually be applying a year prior to entry or two years? Yeah, um, so as mentioned earlier, the timeline really differs by school. So some schools do, do one year prior, some do three years prior. Some you can just go directly right now and, uh, and enter and they are less selective. Um, but for sixth form entry, 16 plus is usually one year prior. Uh, but for 13 plus, 12 plus, 11 plus, it depends by it depends on the school. In terms of the um, actual assessments, again, it also it also differs by school. Uh, we would recommend that students first of all have a think about whether they want to go for all boys or all girls, because these schools tend to be more selective, and therefore the registration date also tends to be earlier. Um, and also, second question that would be thinking when you want to go at 11, 13, or 16, um, or even in between those ages as well, because that will then impact on what kind of assessments you need to do and when you need to start preparing. I sometimes actually feel it takes a bit uh, uh, more, 
longer time for students to prepare for the 11 plus and 13 plus simply because they're younger. If they're at 16 plus applying for the last two years of boarding school, they tend to assess them on subject knowledge, uh, which could coincide with their local curriculum, right? But if they're younger, the gap tends to be a bit bigger. And also they're younger, um, it's harder to prepare them and ensure that they perform on the day. So it takes a bit more time to immerse them into the learning uh, uh, style. Uh, thank you, Jen. I believe we only have time for about one more question. Uh, so the last question is, um, what do you think is the most challenging part for boarding school entry that Hong Kongers should be aware of? Um, I think the academic side of things can be prepared, you know, and depending on how much time you, you have, you can, you know, basically um, um, put more energy into it, right? I think one thing that uh, I think is very qualitative, um, and if, whether a student gets it or not, um, we ask schools for, for feedback. They often say, oh, we want to see if they're the right fit. If they have that spark, if, they, if we see them uh, enjoying the school, right? So it's very qualitative. It kind of is very soft, but at the same time, it's so true. So I would really encourage parents to actually visit the school. Because if you visit the school, um, as I heard from a uh, earlier speaker, you can smell the school and then you will know which school is really right for the child. And uh, so in the interview, um, you know, they can also portray in a more natural way to the interviewer. So I think it's really interview because at the end of the day, you know, getting through the assessments, you could technically prepare for these assessments. But when it comes to whether you're the right fit or whether you have the spark right for that school, it's really about cultural fit. Thank you, Jen, and uh, thank you for your time today and for joining us and sharing all your insights. Now, before I let you go, uh, do you have any last words for our guests? Um, I would say, uh, you know, I think a lot of parents love ranking tables, and I know ranking tables are a great reference point, um, and, uh, but do actually ensure that you understand that secondary school uh, is really a stepping stone into university. So it's really about personal development as well. So find a school that you feel the child can enjoy and excel in um, is at times more important than just going by the ranking tables. For your detailed information regarding boarding school preparation and the application process. Yes, and you have a great school coming up, Bradley, right? <laughs> Uh, yes. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hi. I love this school. I love Radley. Just want to say. <laughs> but my son is, up in, is applying in nine years. Okay, Perry. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jen. I would now like to introduce Harry Hammond of Radley School. Harry Hammond started teaching at Worksop College, then moved to Bedford School where he became a day housemaster, then on to Radley for the last 26 years. At Radley, Harry was head of chemistry and then a boarding house master for 12 years. Since 2010, he has been on the senior management team as head of the extracurricular program and now as head of external affairs, including international recruitment. In the last five years, Radley's proportion of international boarding students has grown from 2% to 13%, with about half that number coming from Hong Kong or mainland China. Welcome, Harry. Thanks, Helen. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Jen Ma, for that uh, kind endorsement of Radley. Uh, we've uh, thoroughly enjoyed working with Arch, I have to say. And uh, as she said, they, they've been looking after a thing we've got called the Greater China Scholarship. Um, we've currently got a boy at the school who's fully funded uh, from Hong Kong, which is, which is a lovely thing to do. So, as Helen said, uh, part of my role now is in looking after international recruitment. And uh, we currently have, I think it's about 35 boys from Hong Kong at the school. Uh, in fact, quite a few of them are, are staying here now over the XCAP weekend and having a great time. Uh, the, uh, I watched them play table tennis last night and it's pretty impressive. Um, so we, we, we love having boys here from overseas and particularly uh, from Hong Kong or mainland China. They, they just offer a kind of freshness to the school, uh, whether they come in year nine or, or year 10 or in the sixth form. Um, they obviously bring uh, academic uh, independence and clout, uh, but equally they are increasingly contributing in many areas of school life. Uh, 
recently we had an eight man debating team and five of those boys were from Hong Kong, which was a, an extraordinary achievement. Some of them, well, a lot of them, it wasn't their first language, of course. In return, I think what uh, you will see uh, from your, by your son coming to a school like this is you will see their confidence grow, their ability to get on with a wide range of people. And I absolutely see that. I see a small boy arriving, age 13, and uh, who can you know, hardly say a word. And by the end, he's looking people in the eye, he's shaking hands, or when he's allowed to. Uh, and uh, he's, he's so much more socially confident. And, and that confidence comes from a boarding community, obviously. Uh, it comes from the classes but it really comes a lot from the extracurricular program. And that's really what I'm gonna talk about here today. Uh, their involvement with other boys in, in different sort of situations, whether it's a completely new activity they're doing or, um, or, or something they're really good at, but, the, but they're mixing uh, and they're evolving with other boys. So I'm gonna talk about the range of activities we have here and uh, reasons why we think they're important. But if you will just bear with me, uh, I'm going to just indulge a little bit of information about Radley. And uh, the first slide is wrong because we're not 690 boys anymore. Sorry, I only spotted that just seconds ago. Uh, we're now at 740. We've opened a new boarding house. So we've got 11 boarding houses. Um, any school will put uh, three things as its pillars. It will have pastoral care, it will have academic success, uh, and it will have extracurricular. Now, to be honest, as a parent, the thing you will want to have right is the pastoral care. That's got to be um, at the center of everything. The well-being of your child has to be the most important thing. And you should get that at any good boarding school in England. Um, but the other two are right up there in terms of your child's development. So that's a picture of some boys. We are very, very close to Oxford. We're about three miles from Oxford. Uh, and that's why they wear those gowns. The Oxford students wear the gowns for their final exams. Um, many of the traditions at Radley are based on Oxford. So we call the boarding houses, we call them socials, which is from the Latin socialis, meaning junior common room. Uh, we have very close links with the university through uh, academia, um, through debating and things like that, going to lectures, but also through some sports as well. So we are blessed with an incredibly beautiful site. It's around about 700 acres. Um, therefore, if uh, at Radley, every boy has approximately an acre to himself, uh, I'm told that if Hong Kong was flattened and everyone had an equal share, everyone would have a square meter to themselves. So, uh, and they come here and they, they love uh, the space. And again, we're not unique. So forgive me sounding a bit of an advert for Radley, but we're not unique. You'll find us at so many schools. They'll get out the car on day one. We had a boy arrive. In fact, it was for the quarantine period. He got out the car, he just opened his arms out and said, this is so exciting. Just the space, the greenery to get around. If you look in the distance, you'll see uh, Oxford. And if you look in the foreground, you'll see a boarding house where we were based and also the extraordinary games pitches. And the facilities at British schools are second to none. It's quite extraordinary. There has been a bit of an arms race in terms of facilities over the last sort of 20 years. So you'll see wonderful sports halls. Um, you'll see sort of climbing walls. Um, uh, you'll see great swimming pools. The uh, thing we are blessed with is all that, but equally our pitches, I think, I say modestly, are probably the best in the country. They are fantastic. <laughs> I just left that one in because it's such a pretty picture. Uh, you can see the college pond there, and that is the eighth golf hole for, for keen golfers, plays over the pond. And the boys sometimes do a little sort of scuba dive and collect a sackfuls of balls out of there. Uh, quite a few schools have golf courses, uh, I would say. Uh, I can do the top of my head about five or six uh, that I know about. There's probably more than that. So just a quick, quick word on the academic before we move on to the co-curricular. Uh, we're around about 90% A star to B. Uh, we've been up to 93% last year and a couple of years ago as well. Um, it just, it depends on the cohort. Uh, you keep pushing. It's all about aspiration though. It's all about the boys at the lower to middle end uh, who you, we bring on to get those B grades or, or even get those A grades. Um, and it's all about great teaching and about great relationships in the classroom. 
And finally, on the academic, uh, a lot of boys coming from Hong Kong are extremely good at mathematics, uh, and it is an extraordinary department. So it says there, two dons uh, teach undergraduates at Oxford, along with their school teaching. And a lot of boys go from the top further math set to Oxford or Cambridge. But we're here really to talk, and that's the end of the advert really, well, sort of. We're here to talk about um, co-curricular, whoops, get that one. And music, let's start with music, uh, which is such a key part of, uh, of a lot of boys' lives. And it's, it's difficult to underestimate the importance of music. What a great skill it is. It just shows uh, a boy's willingness to put in the hours. It shows a boy's willingness uh, to be part of a team. Uh, and it also says an awful lot about the way he can perform under pressure. It is extraordinary training to perform under pressure. I see these boys doing solo concerts and I'm just blown away. They are, they've got an, a big audience in front of them. They've got to control their fine motor skills, can control their nerve, control their heartbeat uh, and perform. And they do perform really well. So music is such a great skill to learn at a young age. Um, I didn't, uh, I, I was more of a sportsman, but I started playing the double bass when I was 40. I had to play in one concert, there were just three of us, two violinists and me, and I've never been so terrified in my life. I was absolutely awful, um, but, uh, but the boys do, do very well. So you will know that, you, you will understand that I'm sure, quite apart from the beauty of the sound and everything else, it's such a great skill for life. Um, so that is a, uh, one of the sections in the orchestra, the flute section. Uh, and you'll see three boys there, and you'll see four boys, I think, one's half hidden, uh, who are from uh, Hong Kong uh, in the flute section. Um, part of the beauty of being an all boys school is that, of course, girls tend to be very, very good at these sort of things at quite a young age. So it's quite nice that a boy can arrive with us, and he might only be um, so I don't know, grade four or something like that, good though that is, uh, but he wouldn't get into an orchestra, uh, possibly an all-girls school or co-ed school even. Um, but he gets in the orchestra and my goodness, he gets better. So again, it's about aspirations, about having opportunities uh, to improve. We have a whole range of, uh, uh, of different groups around the place. We have jazz groups. Uh, we have things called coffee concerts every week. Uh, um, we have um, swing band, big band, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and, and again, most schools will provide that. The choir is uh, terribly important to us. We have a choir of over a hundred, uh, increasingly well represented by boys from Hong Kong. Uh, choir. One of the things that's nice about these kind of schools is that uh, you don't have to be a first fifteen rugby player or uh, even a top academic or whatever it is to earn the respect of others. And, and being part of something like a choir uh, does earn you uh, a huge amount of kudos. The other boys uh, respect the beautiful sound that comes from the, squire, from the choir. They also lead the singing in chapel, which is really important to us and to other schools as well. So moving on from music to drama, uh, this is Sweeney Todd, in case you're worried, it looks like a, a sort of assassination attempt. Um, there are huge numbers of opportunities uh, to take part in drama uh, and we do a musical every other year and if I'm honest it's probably the one area where boys from Hong Kong or China are not massively well represented uh, I'm just not sure that they feel they can do it often which I think is a real shame uh, I'd like to see it more um, because as I said there are opportunities and a bit like music, why is drama important? Well, it's the teamwork, it's the discipline, but it also, I think, brings out a whole side to a boy's character that you might not know is there. I can think of one boy who came to my boarding house um, uh, from a, a state school, in fact, and this was quite a big change room, he was on a, on, a, on a big bursary, and he was very, very shy, never said a word really most of his first year, and then gradually you saw his confidence develop. And in his last year, he won a thing called declamations, which some schools do, where you have to learn a piece and declaim it in front of your year group. Um, and he also had a leading part in the school play. And I remember seeing him walk on and do his part uh, brilliantly. And it was, uh, so it was, the, the drama, I think, can, can bring out a, a special 
side to the boys. Uh, it is also, uh, from their point of view, a good way to meet girls, and they, they rather like that as well. Uh, this was a, a junior play we did recently. But when the boys arrive here, they are part of a drama competition, and I think a lot of schools do the same kind of thing. Uh, they put on a piece after, they've only been at the school about three or four weeks, uh, and they put on a little piece of drama. Uh, uh, and, and again, uh, like the other things we've been talking about, it's not necessarily the sportsman, it's perhaps the quieter boy uh, who shows something a little bit different on the stage, and he gets to know the other boys in his year group well, uh, they earn respect, uh, and they have a lot of fun as well. So that was a whole school production of a musical, which is very colourful and uh, enjoyable. Art, let's move on to art. Um, art, I think, is particularly useful because this time, perhaps we're not talking about teamwork, we're talking about individual skills. Um, one of the questions we're often asked on the admission side is, what sort of boy is suited to Radley? And I would say what sort of boy is suited to, to any boarding school, really. Um, I, I always say two things. One is I think that it's something that he wants to do. He wants to really invest in five years at the school and both his parents want to do the same thing. That might sound an obvious statement, but it isn't always true. There can be a push from more one type than the other. The other thing I think is he, he likes, he has to like to be busy. And art's one of those things on a Sunday afternoon or something like that, he'd go to the art studios uh, and spend time working on a project. There'll be someone there just to supervise him. Uh, and uh, I think that's really important. And again, it, it's sometimes as a boy or a girl, you can get pigeonholed. You can be someone that's only good at sport, only good at academics. When they come to school like this, they can have the opportunity to try something new, try, try something that they didn't know they were good at. Uh, and I wish I'd learned art uh, when I was at school, I have to say. So we put art everywhere around the school and you'll see it at a lot of schools. Um, uh, and it really uh, brightens the place up in, in all departments. And I teach chemistry and we've got a huge amount of artwork up, up on our walls. And it's, it's lovely to see. And you know, there'll be all sorts of different ways of doing the art. Obviously, you have the pottery, the model building, model building uh, apart from the usual um, uh, painting. So on to sport. And a huge number of sports are played at British schools. Um, we do rowing, rugby, hockey, cricket, football and tennis uh, as our sort of major participation sports, but there's a huge range of other sports. Uh, we mentioned golf earlier, uh, uh, any number of racket sports. Um, we had a boy come recently from Hong Kong in the bottom rugby team in his year group in his first year, and he finished the term in the top team. And we're seeing that more and more, um, that uh, that it can be rugby or rowing or sports perhaps you didn't expect again something they didn't expect to be good at they find they are um, and health and fitness generally is something that is uh, quite rightly uh, quite a buzz around in Britain uh, a lot of young people when they leave school they go to gyms and things like that so getting them used to looking after their body uh, and therefore keeping their mental fitness as well is really important we've got a high-tech rowing tank uh, we do actually have a, a boy from mainland China who's pushing for a place in the first eight this year, which is, which is really nice. Uh, football, a lot of the boys like football, which is great. It's, uh, it's not, it's not <laughs> by no means uh, vital they like football, but it kind of is a good thing because a lot often in a boarding house, a boy will say, let's go have a kick around and it's nice if the, the boy likes to do that. Uh, it's not a, a major, major sport for us, but we do have about 180 boys representing the school on match days on most Saturdays in the Lent term. Tennis is increasingly popular and uh, boys are well represented from uh, all parts of the world on that one. But it's not just tennis, it's we have real tennis, we have squash, badminton, fives, you name a kind of ball sport, we do it as do a lot of schools. Uh, now here's a sport where you don't see many boys from Hong Kong. Uh, it's a sport that, that Radley's pretty good at and uh, uh, we've had a couple of captains of the England cricket side uh, go to the school. I would like to see at some stage, and I'm going to keep tabs on this, uh, to see a boy from Hong Kong or mainland China in the first 11. It might take a few years. I have to say they're not pushing at the moment. There's just a couple more sports pictures, just moving along swiftly. Badminton, 
Uh, it's a traditional sport for Hong Kong boys, and they're very good at it, and they have the opportunity to do it, which is lovely. Uh, and it's great. Yeah, they, they need some things that are familiar to them, the, the badminton or the, or, the, or the table tennis, in addition to, to trying something new. Now, Outward Bounds is a, uh, uh, something that uh, could be something completely new to boys. Uh, we have a CCF section, as do a lot of schools. Uh, we do the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which again is, is pretty much most schools do the Duke of Edinburgh Award. And these expeditions are memorable. I have to say, I can still remember mine vividly uh, 45 years ago. Uh, I remember, I remember the rain. Actually, I do remember bright sunshine as well. I remember the insects. Uh, I remember the food that wasn't very good. Uh, but I do remember just in the end, you look back and you think, even though you have blisters on your feet and things, uh, you've had a fantastic time. There is nothing uh, more bonding than with a group of boys, you've overcome adversity, you've walked a long way, uh, you've learned some important skills as well in terms of looking after yourself with a, having to read a campus, compass and a map, um, how to put up a tent and all those sort of skills. But it's more important is that you, uh, you just have this fantastic bonding exercise with your team. So Outward Bounds is a, a, a great thing. Um, so co-curricular isn't just all about sort of activities and movement. It's also about smaller sort of quieter clubs. This is the film unit. Um, uh, but you'd expect, we have a, we have, which is, um, if you look at our videos on our website, they're all made by boys, uh, overseen by member staff, of course, but, but they do learn great skills. We have quite a few people go on into the film industry from the school, actually. Uh, but you've got a whole load of range of societies. We've got things such as philosophy, journalism, water polo, clay pigeon shooting, contract bridge, horse racing, uh, wine tasting, you name it. Uh, we do it, as do an awful lot of schools. Uh, it, it is uh, just part of the richness of the place. So just coming to the end of the 20 minutes now, I'll just finish with that picture because uh, it's such a great picture from our coffee shop. Um, so let me just summarize uh, four quick points to, to finish off. So co-curricular, it's the reason uh, a lot of families want to send their child over to Britain. It's what the boys want and it is what we do. Uh, the skills learned from the co-curricular program will be uh, make your son a more rounded and dare I say more interesting person. It will undoubtedly be something that a future employer will be interested in. A friend of mine works on the recruitment side for Vodafone and uh, yeah, he'd expect them all to have A grades, he'd expect them all to have 2-1 or better degree. What he wants to see is what kind of person are they? What are they interested in? What do they do that they don't have to do? Do they make the effort to go and play the music, to be in the sports team? to do the society. Well, how interesting are they? Do they make him laugh? And often, and often those sort of skills are learned through these activities. Um, at school, uh, boys don't have to be the best at everything. Um, it's about aspiration and, and they can be very poor at something, but they come to somewhere like this uh, and they learn to get good at it. Uh, and finally, uh, like you speak to anyone, I bet you, you turn around now and speak to someone, uh, what's your life like? They'll say busy. Life is busy. Life is used to doing lots of things. And balancing academic, sport, and co-curricular is great training for life. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of my talk, and uh, we can have some questions, but uh, the contact details are below. Thanks. Thank you, Harry, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, certainly a, a beautiful campus. Um, so we'll begin the uh, Q&A session now. So the first question is, uh, what are the years of entry available at Radley and how many places are offered for those overseas entries? Per, per okay, year? sure. Can you st say the start of the question again, Wallace? Yes. So what are the years of entry uh, okay. that's available at Radley? Okay. So years of entry. I mean, the main point of entry is year nine, um, uh, which is when we have an intake of 140, 150 boys. Uh, we do take some boys in year 10, but... Um, I would, if you're thinking of coming over, I should definitely look to go in year nine. Year 10, it depends, it varies, maybe about eight boys, something like that. And then the other point of entry is the start of the sixth form. <clears throat> so it's year 12, um, where we, now that we've got another boarding house, instead of taking our usual kind of eight or 10, we're now taking 20, 25. So <clears throat> that is an important point of entry. And we welcome applicants there. We welcome points of those three points, but mainly year nine and mainly year 12. And in terms of assessment, 
Um, as parents probably know, a lot of boys are now being assessed when they're in year six, is we, when we do the ISEB common pretest, uh, and that's when decisions are made for, for, year, for when they're in year nine. But you can apply any time through year six, seven, or eight, because obviously there's a scholarship uh, in year eight as well. Uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, and furthermore to that question, uh, how many places do you offer uh, each year? How many places? Yes, are offered, in, correct. In total. So, um, well, for, for year nine entry, as I said, it's 140, 150 boys come in. Uh, year 10, eight to 10 boys, six form, 20, 25. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, to add on to that question, how does the applicant application process um, look for um, an applicant, especially uh, from someone that's interested in applying from Hong Kong? Okay. Um, well, um, the application process said should start, ideally, you know, parents are thinking about it in year six is a good time to think about it. Um, uh, they contact the school. Uh, in the old days, pre-COVID, they'd come and visit, as I think Jennifer said quite rightly, that is by far the best thing to do is to come over and visit schools. Now, we can't do that at the moment. So there's lots of virtual tours and things going on. Um, if, if possible, it's got to be a good thing, I would think, to come over to the country for possibly year seven and eight as well. Um, and secondary schools will help um, coordinate that with the prep school to direct them to, to various prep schools where they can go. Uh, I know it's not for everyone, but I think it's, it's, it's good to do two years to, so they kind of learn the ropes when they're young, they make friends, and then they move on uh, to the school with those friends. Um, uh, for sixth form, uh, the application is in uh, November prior to entry, so it's quite a later entry. All schools will assess in November prior to the following September. Thank you, Harry. Um, and uh, for those that are applying, how should they prepare? Like what kind of boys uh, are you looking for? Um, okay, that's a great question. And, and, and the answer is, and any school, well, I hope would say this, is that we're not looking for any kind of boy. Uh, we're just looking for somebody that really wants to come and someone that uh, we feel will benefit from the school. Um, it's really important that I, I think often you hear the word fit used, you'll be a good fit. That, that's, not, that's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for a type to fit into a certain pigeonhole. We're looking for someone who can come here who will, yeah, they've got to cope with it because you know, they, they've got to fly thousands of miles and they've got to show independence, which is why I think we, we really admire these boys coming uh, from Hong Kong, because they show that. Um, they've got to have that ability. They've got to, uh, we think, be able to get along with other boys. Obviously, that is important. So they've got to have, I think, a certain amount of social ability, um, because we don't want someone, and parents don't want it either, for someone who's going to lock themselves in their study and do and just uh, study, study just, just work for five years. So we've got to fear somebody that will take advantage of what we've got here. So there is no, um, there's absolutely no type. I think what we would all say, uh, I think, is that when they leave at the end of five years, they will have certain attributes um, in common. And those things such as sociability, such as an interest in other people, such as a kindness and generosity, which I think boarding brings out, because you have to be like that to get along. Yeah, you come here as a bit of a kind of, um, I don't know, sort of look at me type person. You're not going to get down too well. So boarding's very good at sort of learning those softer skills, but so definitely there's no, there's no type. Uh, in terms of preparation, I would say part of, the interview, part of the application process is an interview. So I just think not, not excessive interview practice, that is the death knell of any application. But I would say getting used to talking to people, just around the dinner table, talking about stuff, being used to having opinions and things like that. That's an important thing for the interview process. Um, the rest of the application is about, you know, realizing the kind of papers they're going to have to sit and doing a, a certain amount of practice at them, of course. Um, and the other thing is to get a nice report from your school. So uh, do lots of good things at their school so they get a nice report. Thank you, Harry. Uh, and the next question is uh, more related to your presentation. Now, regarding extracurriculars and co-curriculars, um, the first question is, uh, some of these trips that you've shown, such as Outward Bound uh, and the travels, is that included or is that an extra charge? And then the second question for co-curriculars is, um, how does Radley balance uh, the student's life uh, with co-curriculars and academics? And uh, you know, is there any guidance program or help given by the school? 
Okay. Uh, in terms of the charges, um, for trips like that for the CCF, um, I think there would be maybe a small charge. I don't think very much. I mean, those trips are not massively expensive to run because the boys are camping, you know, so it's just a transport getting up and back. But I mean, uh, very little for that sort of thing. The, the, the charges would come more for the trips, say perhaps you're, you're flying with the, uh, the History of Art group, you're going to Florence. Uh, obviously, you know, there's going to be a charge for that sort of trip. Uh, for sports trips and things like that, yes, there would be a charge. But for things such as CCF, I think, if anything, it's very small. I don't think it's a big deal. So uh, uh, I wouldn't concern yourself about that. We, we, we want the boys to get out and about. Um, often it's a case of just driving in a minibus and dumping them somewhere and, uh, and letting them camp and things. So no, very small is the answer for that stuff. Um, the other question you asked, uh, it's already gone out of my head. What was it you asked about? Uh, how does the school uh, help balance, uh, balance between balance. academics? Yes. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so when the boy arrives, he would have a housemaster who is his key person for five years. There's no doubt about it. The housemaster will know your son really well. He'll know, your, he'll know you. Uh, he'll know your other children. He'll, he'll know your dog's name or whatever. You know. uh, so the, the housemaster gets to know the child really well. Now, every housemaster would encourage the boy to do lots of things. He will also have an overview of the academics and the reports come in regularly. Every school will be doing internal reports probably every quarter of term. So you get lots of internal reports, you get lots of feedback from teachers. If it's not working out, if a boy's overstretched, then, then we need to, to, to come in and uh, check that the schedule works. Uh, and it could be that you say, look, you've got too much on, you need to give that up. Um, uh, normally it's amazing what boys can achieve. Uh, that, what I've just said sometimes is a problem. Often I think boys take on more and they continue to thrive. That's the old thing about give a job to a busy man. Um, so the boy that's in the, in the rowing eight and he's, and he's uh, uh, it means he gets into that rowing eight and, and his work improves. Even though he's putting in more time to the sport, the, the, the kind of discipline and the physical well-being has improved his work. So uh, I, I, I'm not a great believer that Oh, he's too busy. It's affecting his work. Nah. Normally, normally they're busy. They work more efficiently. Every, every day you've got 24 hours. You can divide it in between eight hours of organized activities like lessons or, or lunch or chapel or, or games. You've got eight hours of sleep, hopefully. That leaves eight hours in a day uh, to do stuff, you know, and, and it's all about efficiency of time, um, not, about, not about the activities, I think. Harry, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for your expertise. Now, before I let you go, do you have any uh, parting words for our guests? Uh, no, uh, I mean, only to say, you know, as I'm sure a lot of people are saying, you know, we, we just look forward to, to seeing you again. It's, uh, we love having visitors here. Uh, we, we love visiting Hong Kong and meeting you there. So let's hope this clears soon and we can, we can see each other in person. Yes, thank you so much, Harry. We hope so too. Thanks for your enlightening presentation about Radley. Our next presentation will be from William Rees, the former director of admissions at Eton College. After 14 years as a house master at Eton College, William Rees became director of admissions in 2001 and steered the introduction of a new transparent and meritocratic entry system for the school. Since returning from Eton in 2009, he has worked as an independent admissions consultant for schools and families. As an associate consultant for BE, he has toured Chinese cities each year, giving talks and advice on UK boarding education. Welcome, William Rees. Thank you very much, Donna Marie. Can you hear me? Excellent, good. Well, good afternoon to you all in Hong Kong, and I'm delighted to be with you, if only electronically in these difficult times. I'm very glad to know that many families in Hong Kong and other parts of Asia remain interested in boarding education in the UK. I'm talking to you from my home and without PowerPoint because I'm giving you an overview from my experience and not representing any particular school. There's a great range of independent boarding schools. They're called independent because they are individual institutions free of state control though they are subject to inspection to ensure educational quality and student welfare. 
Most do not have shareholders. Any surplus is reinvested in facilities and staff and in financial assistance for students who need it. Within that great range of schools, the essence of parental choice and student recruitment is this, getting the right child in the right school for the right reasons. Schools at the top academic end are highly selective and very oversubscribed, and they require a high level of competence in English at assessment and on arrival, with few if any concessions made on that. Other schools who have a, a less competitive entry field offer linguistic support to students who are less fluent in English on arrival. A few schools have special international sections for the progressive integration of students who arrive with weak English. Now there's a tendency in Asia to over-focus on a few world famous schools which are seen as top global brands. Eton, Winchester, Harrow, Wickham Abbey, Shelton Ladies College. This exclusive ambition is not wise. If you have an academically powerful child with other talents and interests, because even the top academic schools will be assessing those other creative and sporting talents and interests, not just IQ scores and examination marks. If you have an academically strong child, by all means aim for the top with one or two of your choices, but then have three or four other schools on a scale of academic performance as an insurance policy, a sensibly graded backup range. If you had decided that the UK model of boarding education is what you want, that is the key thing. And then it is, then it is a matter of finding the right level and style of school for your child. There are many brilliant schools which are not world famous, but which add huge value to the development of children who are of reasonable to good ability, rather than being obvious high flyers from the start. And they do it without pressurizing those children beyond their natural capacities, but by stimulating them in every way. And those students will move on to good universities, even if not perhaps necessarily Oxford, Cambridge or Harvard. It's important to grasp that academic performance and potential form only part of the assessments carried out at UK schools. Their ethos is to give every student the opportunity to fulfill himself or herself in every way, through a broad liberal curriculum, through sport, through music, drama and art and many other activities, and to build character through broad development of life skills, confidence, resilience, adaptability, critical thinking, emotional intelligence and good listening, friendly competitiveness, teamwork, loyalty and social awareness, creativity, initiative, leadership and responsibility within a community with a shared sense of purpose. Beyond academic marks, UK schools are looking for the potential in the student to respond to that great range of developmental opportunity, to put a lot in and therefore get a lot out. What we know from experience in the UK is that the best academic results are achieved by students who are fulfilled as all round human beings, who have been creatively challenged by the liberal curriculum and at the same time supported by a strong pastoral system focused on the individual. Students achieve their potential when they are happy and comfortable in a school environment and not when they are over pressurized by unrealistic parental aspirations and expectations. Now, this may be an uncomfortable message for you to hear, but it is an important part of your understanding as you approach UK boarding. When children are not comfortable in their academic environment, it causes unhappiness, underachievement, and sometimes serious emotional and psychological problems. Asian students who are over-tutored 
and focused only on high marks, tend not to present themselves as having the potential to respond to the opportunities I have outlined. And rejection at assessment can be puzzling to their parents. In my time running admissions, Eton College typically rejected at least 30% of the top 100 scorers on the pure tests, and I believe it's still the same. Top UK schools are looking for students who are open to new experience, imaginative, creative and critical in their thinking, intellectually curious and excited about ideas and knowledge. Students who convey a versatile commitment and generosity of spirit, who will integrate socially and not just stick to their own ethnic group and not just sit in their room playing computer games. Parents seeking the UK model of boarding education have a vital role in encouraging and developing this expansive spirit in children well before they apply to UK schools. Without overstructuring things, children need freedom to play imaginatively and to explore non-academic activities for their own sake, rather than just for certificates. I have a vivid memory of the first evening of my first visit to Hong Kong six years ago. I met a mother whose very intelligent daughter was soon to be a candidate for entry to one of the very top UK girls' schools at age 16. The girl was also a very talented violinist, but the mother had stopped her violin lessons and practice so that she could have extra maths tutoring. That is absolutely the wrong approach and is not what UK schools want, even at the highest academic level. I advised her to reverse that strategy immediately. She did, and the girl got a place at that leading school. In my experience, in bridging educational cultures, there does tend to be a particular misunderstanding about maths. Many Asian children excel at mathematical problem solving, of course, and we welcome and admire that. But if it means that they have no passion and no analytical interest in subjects like history and literature and languages, because those subjects are not precise in their outcomes, those students are not attractive to UK school assessors who are looking for open rather than closed minds. All of this is why the interview is so important as part of assessment. For many schools, the interview is as important as the tests and the two are considered together along with a report from the present school. The interview can be a culture shock for Asian students. It may well be the student's first experience of the teacher-student relationship in the UK, which is based on interaction and discussion, on mutual critical exploration of knowledge and ideas, rather than education as a package delivered by the teacher to be absorbed by the student and regurgitated in examinations. Every interview is unique, with its own flow and no ticking of boxes. Answers are not right or wrong. The interest is in the quality and coherence of thought and expression, in the student's personality, enthusiasms, imagination and curiosity. The interviewer is quietly thinking, would I like to have this student in my class? Would I like to have this student in my boarding house? The student will be invited to disagree and argue and ask to defend his or her ideas and opinions. This can all be very disconcerting for students who are not prepared for it. And either they lapse into fearful silence or they talk too much because they are nervous. I always tell students when I'm preparing them for the interview experience that the more it feels like a dynamic and interesting 50-50 conversation, the better it's going. 
The more it feels like an uncomfortable one-way interrogation, the worse it's going. And when I say preparing for interview, I don't mean coaching in what to say. Pre-learned responses are obvious to school interviewers and are counterproductive. Schools want to meet the real personality of the student. Some schools, including Eton now, also require candidates to take part in group activities, which will give an impression of their leadership qualities, their attitude to teamwork, their capacity for listening and empathy, and a sense of how well they will fit into a boarding community, or perhaps not. The higher up the academic scale you're aiming, the earlier you need to start planning, researching, and taking knowledgeable advice. Every independent school has its own timing and its own process, though there is some sharing of tests. But broadly, for top girls schools, you need to register by age nine for assessment at 10 and entry into year seven at age 11. Though there are also some places at age 13. For top boys schools, must be registered by 10 for assessment at 11 and entry at age 13. It is important to note, by the way, <clears throat> that most of the schools at the top of the academic rankings are single sex. Formal applications are largely enforced at the heavily oversubscribed top schools and their entry cohorts are fixed after assessment. But many co-educational schools offer a more flexible pattern for overseas students. And it is sometimes possible to find a late place in year 10 when the student is already 14 years old. Entry into year 11 is very hard to find and educationally unwise because UK students are halfway through their GCSE courses at that point and a new arrival will have missed a year of foundation work. There is also entry into year 12 at age 16 for the two years to A level, which can be the right option for certain students. At the top end of that market, vacancies are few, competition is fierce, but many other schools do have a more hospitable planned entry at 16. Candidates for entry at age 16 should expect four or five subject-based and general interviews at each school they try. An application needs to be made, in most cases, a year before entry. Though at a few top schools, for example, Wickham Abbey, the process now begins 18 months before entry. Well, I've tried in this short talk to give you some key principles and insights distilled from my 20 years of experience in school admissions and 14 years before that as a housemaster. I hope it's been useful and we'll be happy now to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, William, and thank you for your insights and expertise. So we'll begin the Q&A session now and I'll begin uh, with the first question as just a reminder to all our guests if you do have any questions please feel free to type them in in the Q&A and we'll try our best to address them. First question is uh, so pastoral support and individual attention to students how do these things work? Well uh, every student will have a housemaster or housemistress uh, in overall charge of them in the boarding house and those housemasters and housemistresses usually have deputies as well. And there will be uh, a lady who will play a kind of matron role, who will look after the welfare of the boys or girls. The uh, domestic staff in the house are also important. Sometimes when I was a housemaster, the first indication to me that something was not quite right with a boy would come from a member of the domestic staff who would notice some change in the pattern of behavior or that a boy was just not quite feeling right. And that would be the beginning of a pastoral process. Uh, beyond the house itself, uh, there is a wide ranging system of tutors 
where um, tutors will be responsible for small group, groups of students and will be responsible for their general cultural education, but also will provide another voice and another ear to listen to that student and to guide that student. Uh, beyond that, there are, of course, doctors and other medical staff. Uh, there are chaplains. Uh, big schools will have a chaplain for all the different religions. And for a student who may run into serious uh, emotional or psychological problems, schools also have access to counsellors and psychiatrists. So the support system is very strong. Thank you, William. Um, next question is, um, how does one gauge the academic level of a senior school? Yes, I, I talked about the importance of having a scale of schools to apply to, um, aiming high, but also having some backups. Now, the worst source of information about the academic level of the school, the so-called league tables published in British newspapers. That is not a, not a reliable source of information. Um, for all kinds of reasons, which it would take a very long time to explain, but trust me, they're not reliable. Taking some knowledgeable advice from people where you are, if you form a kind of long list of schools, you can then do your own research and construct your own league table uh, of schools. And the way I suggest you do it is you look at the school's A-level results, the exam taken at age 18, and you identify the percentage, and this should be on the school's website, you identify the percentage of students scoring A star, A or B grades at A level, the grades that will get the student into a good university. Don't look just at one year's results, but look at four or five years to see if there is a trend upwards or downwards. Um, and somewhere like Winchester, or Wickham Abbey Girls School, you would expect 95% roughly of their students to be scoring A star A, B at A level. At Eton, it will be probably 94. At Radley, Tunbridge, Abingdon, it's going to be 93, 92. These figures will change a little bit from year to year, but you'll be able to identify a pattern. But what's also important is that when you're exploring schools, visiting or visiting them virtually, you find out what the entry standard required is for that school. Because there are some very brilliant schools which add enormous value to students' academic progress, which have a lower entry standard than places like Eton and Winchester and Wakeham Abbey and so on. So identifying the entry standard is also important. A school such as Eton will require a 65% plus score on the qualifying exam taken at age 13, just before entry. Um, but there are fantastic schools like, for example, King's Canterbury or Canford, which have a 55% threshold for entry at age 13 in the qualifying exam, but are still getting A-level results on my suggested measure around 83, 84, 85% of students uh, getting A star AB at A level. So it's important not just to look at the kind of crude A level results themselves, but to also to set them against the entry standard required of that school at the age of 13. I hope that's helpful. Uh, no, that's great. Thank you, William. Uh, so the next question is, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, many of the top boarding schools in the UK are single sex uh, schools. Now, uh, why is that? And what are the benefits of single sex education? Yeah, well, in the UK, we think it's important that people have the choice. Some people believe very strongly in co-education. Uh, others can see and respond to quite a lot of research that shows that boys and girls mature differently and learn differently. Uh, their emotional development takes place at a different pace. And there are also all kinds of traditional cultural factors in play 
that parents need to weigh up when deciding between single sex and, and co-education. Single sex schools can tailor what they do and how they educate students to the particular learning and developmental patterns identifiable in boys and in girls. They also remove prejudice about what are boys subjects and what are girls subjects. So for example, girls tend to flourish particularly in single sex schools in maths and science and design and technology, where they feel, they feel unconstrained by the presence of boys and can really fulfill those potential, their potential in those ways. It can also be argued that boys thrive much more in subjects like the arts and humanities and languages when they are on their own. From my own experience and that of my colleagues at Eton, I would also say certainly that when you're dealing with sensitive subjects in literature, in philosophy, in social and health education, boys are much more emotionally open and honest in responding to these subjects when they're on their own than when there are girls in the room. And of course they get lots of opportunity to mix with girls in the holidays and lots of opportunity to mix with girls through activities like drama and music and social evenings uh, because boys and girls schools will frequently link up for this kind of activity. So boys schools are not monasteries. <clears throat> they are open to the world in that sense, but they can offer considerable advantages in the upbringing of boys and in ways which many of us believe bring great developmental benefits to the male sex. Sure, of course. Uh, thank you, William. And uh, to follow up on that question, um, what is the, um, for those that are perhaps relocating to the UK, um, mm. what about the day schools there? And what is the preference? Is it uh, boarding school versus day school? What are the advantages, uh, benefits for both? Yeah, <clears throat> well, obviously it partly comes down to the personality of the student. And the student, as, you, as you've heard me say, and I'm sure you've heard from the schools you've been listening to this morning, a certain kind of personality and attitude is required to make a success of boarding. It isn't right for everybody. Um, and some, for some students, family life, seven days a week, is very important to them. Uh, and they would find it very difficult to give that up uh, and go off to a boarding school. But if a, if a family is relocating to London, and we're probably talking principally about London, there are a lot of powerful day schools in London. It's not a market that I recommend. It is ferociously com competitive. Uh, competition to get into the top London day schools is massive and they have to be very ruthless in their application and testing procedures. They go very much more on test results and much less on interview and all round qualities. Um, it's a very stressful market and a lot of families and children in the London day school market do get very stressed by the whole process. Um, but you know, if that is what a family wants and is relocating to London, then there's plenty of good advice available on the best schools. But again, the same principle will, will apply of aiming high, but having some good backups. Thank you, William. And uh, I believe we have time for about one more question. Now, uh, what support is given in university applications to the UK or to the US or uh, uh, elsewhere for that matter? Yeah, well, all UK, all good UK schools invest a great deal in advising, supporting and guiding students through the uh, entry, through the application process to UK and US universities. And all good UK schools have good channels of communication with American universities as, as well as British universities. And they will help students to prepare. Uh, there's been a, quite an increase in the number of students going to the USA for a different kind of experience. 
uh, our students. One warning though, um, students going from the UK to the USA are often very bored in their first year at UK, uh, at US universities. Uh, and my advice would always be to sign up for subjects if you're going to America that in your first year will be very different and, and give you new challenges compared with what you've learned in UK schools because well, the A-level course in a UK school really kind of overlaps with the first year at, at American universities. But those channels of contact are very strong. Students get a great deal of support and advice in university admission. Thank you, William. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate your time and sharing all your expertise and insights for entry into boarding schools. Now, before I let you go, uh, do you have any parting words for our attendees today? Well, just that um, I hope that my talk has both encouraged you to think about boarding in the UK, but also given you a clear uh, set of signposts towards the things that could be difficult, that could involve culture shocks, uh, and about the kind of things that UK schools are looking for, and the kind of spirit and attitude that's needed in students. So I hope you've got a good balance from me uh, in that respect. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, William, for your very insightful, knowledgeable uh, presentation, which helped immensely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'll now, thank you. I'll now hand you over to Howard Tuckett, the headmaster of Wickham Abbey School in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, Donna Marie, and thank you uh, from me to William as well for joining us. So, William, uh, you've been a, an outstanding speaker and uh, you've, you've closed for us a wonderful three weeks of insight and expertise right across the range of British boarding schools and I can't think of anybody better suited um, as a former registrar at Eton College and also for your, your very broad expertise for children coming from this part of the world. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. I enjoyed and, uh, it. And thank you. Thank you for, to our other speakers today, Graham May from Abingdon, uh, Dr. Nick Black from Dulwich College, uh, Jennifer Ma from Arch Education, and, and Harry Hammond uh, from Radley, uh, who together with, with William Rees have given us an outstanding uh, afternoon here in Hong Kong, a pretty early morning for some of them there in UK, uh, but an, an outstanding event. Um, we, we are always here in Hong Kong, Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong. Uh, do contact us if there's anything you missed, anything you'd like uh, so we, anybody you'd like to be put in touch with, any questions we can answer for you, advice we can give you about making contact with any of these schools or any of the many questions that have come up, uh, do get in touch with us here at Wickham Abbey. Thank you for all your questions, which really have made this the most entertaining uh, three Saturdays worth of, of events. So thank you to our, I think at last count, uh, heading up towards 1,500 uh, participants in, in the event over the last three weeks. Our very sincere thanks to Ruth Benny and Top Schools in Hong Kong for hosting the entire event on their Zoom platform. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I can see you down on the thumbnail there, so thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we do look forward to seeing you at many other school events uh, as where, where you appear as a guest or a host uh, in and around Hong Kong. Thank you to my team here, to Wallace Wong, uh, who has worked with me throughout the entire project and our presentation and hosting team today here, Donna Marie Mitchell and Helen Manalia Wood. Thank you uh, to all of my people here. They're actually sitting about six feet away from me in other classrooms and offices, uh, but we're all here uh, hosting you today. Uh, and do get in touch and do come and see us here at Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. We are a British uh, curriculum prep school, uh, a private school that is here for all Hong Kongers. Uh, we are not an international school just for expatriates. We have Hong Kongers and expatriates at the school, and we would like to meet you. So this closes our three weeks of uh, introductions and insights from British boarding schools. We look forward to bringing you a very similar event next year. Um, hopefully we won't have to think on our feet quite so much to uh, tap dance our way around COVID challenges. We all look forward uh, to a calmer world, a calmer year uh, for schools. Uh, but whatever the next year brings you, we bring you all our very best in education and your wider lives. And from all of us, thank you very much for being with us and good evening.